Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Amal Andraus. I'm the Dean of the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, welcoming you to this uh, really uh, heartwarming and important event on the recovery of Beirut after the explosion of August um, 4th. Before I say a few words uh, about uh, Beirut and its special place um, in my heart and in our imagination as architects and planners from around the world, I want to thank uh, Heba Bouakar, a uh, professor here at the school, uh, as well as all our incredible alumni, um, colleagues, friends uh, that I saw on the screen before the event went on and, uh, uh, and that you will have a great uh, pleasure, I think, of hearing today. Um, Beirut is a very small, um, but very large uh, in terms of uh, what it suggests uh, historically uh, about the development uh, of cities, of culture, uh, of geographies, uh, of policies and politics, uh, um, but it's, it's, it's very large uh, in terms of the weight it carries as to uh, what has been done uh, in terms of imagining uh, what cities can do and can be and, and how people can live and uh, I think what it can do in the future. So, um, as I think Heba and the panelists will share today, there's been so many iterations of uh, rebuilding, reconstructing, recovering now, uh, and yet um, uh, uh, we are back again, but I hope, um, we all hope um, this time that um, some of the foundations will be uh, stronger uh, infrastructural uh, um, housing, uh, um, questions of preservation, uh, the virtual uh, uh, and the physical coming together, uh, so much to learn. Uh, from Beirut and to project outwards and also so much for all of us to give back uh, in terms of our knowledge um, and um, our care um, for for the city. So welcome everyone and I turn it over um, to Heba uh, and to the first um, panel. Good afternoon and good evening, good morning to all the 500 plus people who are joining us uh, from across the globe to talk about emergency architecture and planning recovering Beirut uh, post-explosion. I'm Heba Barker, Assistant Professor of Urban Planning at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. We'll use GSAP for short. Before I introduce the panelists, I want to thank Dean Amal Andrawos for making GSAP a place where it is possible to convene and have such critical and imminent conversations about architecture, planning, and the built environment. I would like to also thank Big Time, Lila Catlier for her amazing support during the preparation for this event and for the AV team. The event today brings people from GSAP and Columbia University along with colleagues from across the globe. Thanks to the 18 panelists for joining us today. From Columbia, I'll start with an alphabetical order. From Columbia, we welcome Zia Jamal Din, Assistant Professor of Architecture, Andreas Hake, Associate Professor of Professional Practice and Director of the Master's Program in Advanced Architectural Design, Laura Kurgan, Professor of Architecture and the Director of the Stan Center for Spatial Research, Jorge Otero Peleos, Professor and Director of Historic Preservation, Mark Wasuto, Lecturer in Architecture, Zainab Bahraini, Edith Porada, Professor of Ancient Near Eastern Art and Archaeology, Department of Art History and Archaeology, and Manan Ahmad, Associate Professor, Director of Graduate Studies, Department of History. From Beirut and across the globe, we welcome Muna Fawaz, Professor of Urban Planning, Department of Architecture and Design at the American University of Beirut. Marwan Gandur, uh, Professor and Director of the School of Architecture at the Louisiana State University. Rania Ghusson, Associate Professor of Architecture and Urbanism, MIT School of Architecture and Planning. Habib Haddad, Managing Partner of the E14 Fund and the founder of Yemli. John Qasir, Co-Founder and Manager, Editor of Megaf Megaphone. Adrian Lahoud, Dean of the School of Architecture, Royal College of Arts. Abir Sa'su, founding partner, Public Works Studio. Nisreen Salti, Associate Professor of Economics, Department of Economics at the American University of Beirut. Rana Samara, Vice President of NGO Nusanid. Hashim Sarkis, Dean of the MIT School of Architecture and Planning. And Wael Sinno, UN Habitat Area Coordinator in Lebanon. The driving force for this event is an amazing group of GSAP students alumni and alumni who I have had the utmost pleasure 
to work with over the past couple of months since the August 4th explosion that ripped Beirut. Their enthusiasm, creativity, compassion, organizing powers, and perseverance, while questioning and pushing the boundaries of what it seems to be, an architect, designer, and a planner at times of crisis have been inspiring to me. In fact, they've given the cynicist in me hope that we will be all right. In fact, they embody the real hope for Lebanon's future. So herefore, I introduce to you and present to you the GSAP Collective for Beirut, representing the alumni we have Iyad Abu Ghaida, Marilyn Antaki, Oud Azzi, Charles Hajj, Maisa Jallad, Ibrahim Kumbarji, Dina Mahmoud, Maya Rafia, Rula Salamun, and current students Aya Abdullah and Michaela Faraon. Just a word about the format, the two hours will be divided into five modules around five topics. We have 20 minutes per module. We hope that this event will be just the beginning of a series that aims to tackle each conversation in more detail in the spring semester and onward. For each module, we have prepared one overarching question. Three or four panelists will take the lead answering each question for about two, two minutes uh, per participant. And then we will open it up for discussion with the rest of the panelists. At the end of the two hours, a number of the panelists, as well as the collective, will stay online for Q&A with the audience for about 30 minutes, till about 2.30 uh, 2 p.m. New York City time, 9.30 p.m. Beirut time. Audience, please feel free to, use you to ask questions as we go through the discussion. We will be collecting these questions and addressing them after we go through the five modules. Thank you for everyone. Thank you for participating, and hope you enjoy that. Hi, everyone. I'm Oud Azdi, GSAP alumna. Thank you, Dean Amal Amrawas and Hiba Boakar for this introduction. And thank you everyone for being here today. We would like to extend our utmost gratitude to Hiba. You've shown tremendous support throughout this process. So thank you for making this happen. We are extremely happy to have such a distinguished panel joining us today to openly discuss the urgency of recovering Beirut. I would like to begin by saying a few words about GSAP. GSAP cultivates a sense of openness among, among students, alumni, and faculty, fostering a space to share ideas, thoughts during our time in school. Yet this does not stop after graduation. GSAP ideology continues as the school does not permit us to remain silent in time of crisis. We were taught to think that architecture is not a mere singular tool, but can be used in various forms and extensions. In this situation, it's an instrument for us in times of emergency. We hope that this event will be one of many by the collective to keep the conversation going about Beirut. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michaela Faron, and I'm a current MRC student at GSAP. I'm thrilled to introduce the GSAP Collective for Beirut. On August 13th, following the tragedy that happened 100 days ago today, a group of GSAP alumni and students came together with the question, how can we bring our expertise and connection to contribute to the great efforts made for Beirut? So we are based in Beirut and New York, but also in London, Amsterdam, Toronto, Cairo, Dubai, and The Hague. Brought together by Zoom, uh, we formed the GSAP Collective for Beirut. The collective is dedicated to the promotion, discussion, and reflection of contemporary issues in the Middle East and Lebanon specifically. We're interested in weaving a cross-functional network that facilitates collaborative thinking by connecting existing areas of expertise within and outside of the school, encouraging cooperative involvement. Collaborating with Assistant Professor Hiba Bouakar, we're, ha we're so happy to be discussing here with all of you today um, Beirut and the aftermath of the explosion that has forever changed the face of the city through this event, Recovering Beirut Post-Explosion. We would like to start with a short work in progress video that draws parallels between the blast and multiple crises in Lebanon that happened throughout the years to situate this conversation in the past, present and future. We hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Ammonium NH4, nitrate. NO3. Never Spilling. would we have thought that rather than an Israeli missile, dripping, an organic storing. compound improperly Clustering. stored at the port of Beirut's warehouse 12 Apocalypse. would cause Dropping. the death and destruction of our city. Exploding. The apocalypse. Exploding longer. Reverberating. Fogging. Bombing, Before the two explosions, spreading, people heard the all-too-familiar sound of jet planes. But it was only the sound of combustion 
impact warning sign simulating that our port and everything within a 10 kilometer radius planning would explode dozing shake and shatter witnessing worrying trembling a wave of stressing, aluminum profiles bent damaging, like string cheese deserting the dust of crumbling leaving, stones cleaning glass shards cutting moving, through everything sinking, and everyone in sight appropriating hospitalizing burning and blaming, us who survived waiting, witnessing it all marrying Hoping nothing will bring us back smiling. to how it was before August 4th. Lamenting. Helping. Offering. Sharing. Rescuing. Helping. Searching. Protesting. Official narratives protesting, say it was all a mistake. That it was out of their hands. Congregating. A mistake is another word for the systemic negligence failing, that fuels the impunity of the ruling class. Sheltering. Stripping. They say the city has to be rebuilt, reconstructed. Gazing. Assessing. We are not falling for that trap refusing, again. Damaging. Rebuilding is the restoring, lingo of real estate vultures restoring, who could care less about these neighborhoods. Their people, Reopening, their character, counting, documenting. We knew about that all too watching, well as well in a city of post war reconstruction. Destroying, inhaling, exhaling, burning, rescuing, cleaning, recycling, gathering, piling. And so Wasting, amid an unprecedented leaking, economic crisis, collapsing, a global pandemic, counting, and a failing nation state, waiting, we recover. Closing, we have become allergic to the word losing, resilience. Stealing, All we can do counting, is attempt to emerge healing, from our collective traumas, shaping, whether lived hoping, or inherited. Hi, my name is Marilyn Antaki, and I'm a GSAP alumna. I'm going to be starting with this first question. Beirut's port has historically been a lifeline to the city and country. Yet, in many ways, the port has increasingly been disconnected from the city. Now that the explosion rendered the port once again central to the discussion around Beirut's economic and physical recovery, what are some of the ways we could start thinking about the port its reconstruction, its relation to the city and residents, and to Beirut's regional and geopolitical position. Marwan Randour, Rania Hossen, Andres Hake, and Isrin Salti can take the lead, followed by an open discussion. Panelists, if you can please turn on your cameras, that would be great, thank you. Hey, hi everybody, I'm Marwan Randour. Um, <clears throat> Uh, thanks for organizing uh, this event. I just want to take uh, maybe one aspect of the question and uh, uh, react to it, which is what are some of the ways in which we can start thinking about the relationship of the port to the city and its residents? And uh, I would suggest that basically, basically maybe we need to ask our, uh, the question of what is our uh, who are we advocating to? Who are we supporting in whatever uh, uh, we, we're acting at, at this moment. I mean, as a lot of studies have covered, uh, the, including, you know, Munafa was and I wrote about this earlier, uh, a decade ago, is that, you know, Beirut is basically a series or, or a, uh, every reconstruction project has created uh, uh, or concentrated power in fewer hands, be it the wealthy or political factions and so on. And the history of Beirut is uh, also a history of continuous uh, uh, sort of fracturing through uh, policies, regulations, and, and reconstruction projects. So I would like to maybe concentrate more on the, uh, 
the, uh, the less obvious, if you want, destruction that is created uh, uh, rather by reconstruction project, but uh, mostly by uh, actually urban regulation. I mean, the, if we think about all the urban regulation that Beirut and uh, Lebanon and a lot of other contexts were subjected to, we can see the, the amount of the destruction that that has created. And one example is the idea that Ekoshar at some point came up with, you know, Beirut being about the concentric rings of uh, density from center outward. I mean, has uh, over the years, uh, concentrated the density uh, into the center, which resulted in continuous destruction until this day out of the historical fabric of the city, and actually uh, resulted in uh, displacing people that have no place in the new developments that concentrated towards the uh, center and so on. We can also look at, uh, uh, you know, all the reconstruction projects. I'm always thinking about if our uh, lines and our regulations and text can produce sound, they probably would produce sound much larger uh, than, the, than the explosion of August 4th as this continuous destruction of the city that happened through uh, the role of planners and designers in, re in creating uh, urban regulation for the uh, city. So the, if we look at Marm Khayel and uh, Jimmaizi, which are the more preserved, if you want, neighborhood, they were preserved in spite of urban regulation, in spite of uh, uh, urban uh, visions. And it's much more uh, because of the, uh, the residents and because of you know, the uh, uh, basically uh, issues of uh, the uh, economy and so on. So I would advocate for uh, abandoning that sort of role uh, of producing regulations, visions, master plans, and so on from, from uh, uh, you know, to the city, and maybe concentrate more on uh, uh, civil rights, uh, the, maybe the, uh, the right for, you know, uh, clean air, the right for uh, natural ventilation, the right of access to light, the right of residents to stay in their historical home. So rights that actually puts uh, this um, uh, these, uh, uh, whatever we advocate for in something outside urban regulation, but part of civil rights, uh, rather, uh, which uh, produce a different role and probably open us to a lot of more actors uh, in the field. And maybe uh, focus more on uh, the present. We as planners, designers, we're very good at analyzing present conditions and presenting it and reproducing it and uh, seek a role in the present in, in which we can uh, actually work with uh, making sure that uh, uh, people have access to their rights and we affirm these rights in the uh, public realm. So the, uh, and, and maybe um, uh, let the future be shaped by how, the, how people act and uh, rather than imagine what the future could be. Maybe we can be surprised as we've always been surprised, I mean, Beirut, both on the high income level and the low income level have created, residents have created their own way of inhabiting uh, the city. And maybe if we uh, actually abandon our role as uh, people that produce master plan visions and, uh, and uh, uh, imagine what the future could be, we can be more effective in uh, carrying the uh, uh, the uh, residents to actually shape the city in whatever uh, form it will take in the future. Yanya? Mm, what a follow-up on, on Marwan, and thank you, Hiba, Gisa, for hosting. Um, so what I, what I want to think with you today is uh, basically attention and the possibility of uh, uh, holding on to thinking about uh, Beirut both the challenges of uh, thinking of a place close to home, but also the lure of not at least being surrounded by um, such, a, such a community of thinkers and doers. So when, when, the, uh, when the explosion happened on August 4th, um, um, the eye of the storm was somehow the port of Beirut. So when the opportunity uh, came to think of what that might be in terms of actively contributing to a, a vision in this uh, in this context. Um, 
I kept going back to the port itself as part of the genesis of the city of Beirut, but also as part of the genesis of the narrative uh, of the city and the country as it's connected to ideas of the crossroads, the entrepot, and in particular, the role of the port as a, as a gateway. So the port has been um, historically a lifeline to the national economy, or at least to its tertiary sector, or at least to the uh, interest of the uh, uh, the rise and the interest of the commercial and financial uh, bourgeoisie. It started as a concession within the Ottoman imperial government that capitalized Beirut and established the growth of a new real estate market. Um, so one, when looking at the violence of uh, the port of Beirut, uh, there's the immediate violence and the trauma of the explosion as the video that we uh, opened up our meeting so uh, genuinely attests to. But I think the violence and the trauma of the port is uh, not only about this immediate explosion, but it's also about a longer history of violence that the uh, organization of the port and the interest and values that it stands for um, have uh, put the city and the country into. So if we're thinking of a port, we're of course thinking of that point of contact between uh, the sea and the land. And with that, a shift in transport modality. So the establishment of the port of Beirut was also the establishment of the Beirut-Damascus road. And one has to think of that uh, uh, historic relationship to Bar sham when one is thinking now of the distance between Beirut to the nearby capital uh, city being its nearest ports. The port is also a major economic multiplier uh, for prosperity and debt for, uh, for the country. So um, in which the port operators, the city and the national government do not necessarily share the same economic goal. The income is related to a flow of dutiable uh, import and the state is heavily reliant um, on the income from the port of Beirut. So one can uh, clearly imagine that tension between an income that relies on uh, import and between the possibility of the port to play its import export relations with its possible relations, not only to the tertiary sector, but how we begin to think of uh, the port as part of a plan in which other sectors of the economy are, are also part of that uh, vision. So how do we think of that? What other programs uh, could be part of that uh, vision of a future that not only recovers a pre-August 4th or a pre-war uh, uh, order, all of which are implicated in this project um, of uh, the port uh, gateway vision. Um, one has to say as well that the port and the uh, storage, uh, the criminal storage and explosion of the nitrate in the city is not the first instance in which uh, stories of merchants of doubt and toxic attacks against the people of Lebanon have been perpetuated. Uh, those who remember the many um, stories of ships that landed with uh, various European toxic waste discharged and uh, managed by the same landlords in their own territories at the moment when the, when the, when the country was cantonized. So that there's a longer history to the toxicity of the port that extends beyond uh, the immediate present. So uh, how do we think of the economic injury and ways of um, thinking of alternative models of economic development and reconstructions, tariffs and taxations and privileges for later generation ports maybe that think of forms of industrial activities and logistics centers uh, in their organization. So what could be these other forms of port city state interfaces that could allow us to think of uh, Beirut and its role in the region. Now, granted, the narrative of the 19th century is no longer the context of the 21st century. And specifically, when we think of geopolitical context, we think of how, necessary, how it's important for these posts to adapt uh, to changing trade patterns, the demands of shipping line, uh, competition from other ports of, and cargo. So the establishment of Beirut as the gateway uh, for the Middle East Arabian hinterland has since been shadows by the establishments of mega ports in the Persian Gulf and by other competition existing or forthcoming in the Northeastern uh, Mediterranean ports. So um, the imperative to think of uh, reconfiguration of uh, the economic vision of the port of Beirut and its urban vision is also tied to the imperative of thinking of uh, Beirut at this expanded scale. And I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm counting on this Reen to anchor in, in real professional term what it would mean to be able to think of such a utility 
in its various roles. So, but now Andres. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. This is a very uh, needed uh, discussion and I'm, I'm really honored to be invited to it, even though my knowledge of Beirut and Lebanon at large is, is very, very reduced. Uh, but I would like to talk about the, the port uh, following HIVA and the, the collective for, for Beirut's invitation, uh, because I've been working in the last years uh, on a number of ports that were really uh, uh, facing in a very direct way uh, the, the effects and also becoming actors in the making of murdering and crime, inequality, uh, consumerism, vulnerability, exploitation, uh, militarization. And I think that this is something that con co converts or kind of turns uh, ports in something that is fundamental, a fundamental state or kind of space and site for, for political action, at the same time, a fundamental space to rethink architectural practices. Uh, the coastal line and ports in particular are both actors, but are also the result of the way forms of exploitation of human towards fellow humans and humans to other than humans have been developed through colonial industrialization. Uh, and this is something that I think is very important in the context of GSAP that has historically engaged with exploring architecture as an ecosystem of practices where the local is highly enacted as transterritorial and in my personal interest as well to see architecture as something that operates across scales and is by that uh, way of operating uh, how I believe that a big part of its political agency unfolds. Uh, if we think of the basically 2,700 tons of ammonium nitrate that were housed at the Beirut port and that detonated the start in all this huge uh, emergent, emergency, it's not an accident that this was, it was ammonium nitrate. And ammonium nitrate that was extracted from Anto, Antofagasta in Chile, a site of huge violence. Uh, it's been actually historical. It's, it was one of the first places, Bolivia, Peru, Chile, that was exploited under both British, Spanish, French, German rule, colonial rule. And actually it was this nitrate that was used both as a fertilizer historically, but also as the power for wars uh, that shaped the history of, uh, of the whole entire region and across the world. Uh, the, it was used during the War of Independence in Chile, the war with uh, Bolivia and Peru, and uh, it was again uh, uh, fueling uh, wars across the world. But when we think now of fertilizers and the way fertilizers have been uh, mobilizing the, both the, the earthy resources of uh, domain and violently domain uh, uh, countries across the world uh, through colonial exploitation. It also tells us a story of um, not only colonization, but exploitation, over exploitation of other than human uh, beings that were turned into resources. And that violence was really not coming without a huge investment in militarization, in power, in the development of weapons. And that is the violence that was also uh, released to the explosion uh, uh, in, the, in the port of Beirut. Uh, it's, it's the, 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 the architecture has been part of this in both sides all the time and in many other, in all the kind of range of sides. Uh, in 1971, Salvador Allende nationalized uh, a big part of the mining resources uh, that were uh, still exploited at that point by uh, international corporations that were replicating the, and kind of uh, prolonging the entire process of colonization. And that two years later, that was the origin of the uh, coup d'etat that also uh, resulted in the death of Allende. Uh, the, the violence now is challenged in the exploitation of, of, the, of the sea in many different ways and this deep sea mining, uh, the exploitation of the biodiversity of the world by laboratories uh, is, is also fueled by forms of militarization and colonial power. And when we think of the way fertilizers are also being imposed on the exploitation of the land and we think for instance of the actual uh, Lebanon uh, 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 agricultural exploitation, for instance, in the Beka Valley, where the, the massive use of fertilizers uh, and centralized production of agriculture is also behind the, the toxicity that the entire region is suffering in the, uh, in, the, in the aquifers and also contributing to the entire Mediterranean 
uh, uh, effects of nit nitrates uh, that it's really reducing, it's very radically reducing the uh, biodiversity of the, of the Mediterranean Sea. But again, this is a, an arena in which architecture is also provided alternatives and it's been part of com community uh, initiatives, networks of association, exper experiences, uh, the development of new technologies in which basically agriculture can happen also in different ways. At the same time that new forms of collective security with regards to water and the management of toxicity, the collective management with toxicity and the coexistence with, coexi coexi uh, with toxicity, it's been explored and, uh, and understood as something that could be politically uh, dealt with uh, under a frame of justice. Uh, the, the, when we think of the coastal line and the, the and harbors and the uh, and Lebanon, the reality of Lebanon in the last decades, and include including also Tripoli, uh, the the huge uh, effects of migrations that were like non like forced migration of humans uh, caused by war, uh, by inequality, by environmental violence, uh, by climate crisis, like Adrian Lahoud would, would, would call them or has called them and, and provided evidences of, uh, is a reality that we have to acknowledge that also has been uh, uh, controlled, produced, uh, and as well as reflected and registered by harbors like the Beirut uh, port. And, and that reality has turned in the last decades the Mediterranean into a weapon to kill people, uh, as uh, forensic oceanography has proved. And we're facing that. So when we're discussing the harbor, it's inevitable to think of the week of the of the news of the last three weeks of families uh, being seeing their kids dying in the ocean, in the in the sea, in the Mediterranean Sea. And this is a reality that is again architecturally, we see how uh, architects, young architects are leading the development of new forms of transforming the Mediterranean. And that, those are the projects that I believe we have to take into account when we're discussing the, the, the port of, of Beirut. So for me, in a way, what we're facing here is something that uh, moves from the scale of local, very local realities to the way those local realities are uh, uh, constructed and enacted through uh, transcolor um, design and neglectment. And, and it's a very political question, which is really uh, the, the one that we're facing is how do we move from a culture of exploitation of hum humans to fellow humans and humans to other than humans to, a, to one of mutual care and mutual uh, solidarity. Thank you, Andreas. Great. Ms. Rin. Thank you so much, Hiba, for organizing this. Thank you, GSAP. Thank you, Laila, for all the uh, logistical help. Um, okay, so this is a very tough act to follow this lineup of three really brilliant interventions. So thank you to my fellow panelists as well. Uh, I'm an economist. So what I'll try to do is actually provide some measurements. Um, and, the, and I think that that will, uh, and, it's, and it's very tentative, right? These are very, very difficult things to measure and everything's quite recent. So, and the scene keeps changing. But hopefully this will maybe uh, ground the thinking about what's, what other role can we imagine for the port or what other model can the port fit into. It'll ground that thinking in at least identifying the sizes of the interests around the current structure and where the port fits into that. It also tackles one specific aspect of the description of the panel um, that, um, that was read uh, at the beginning, which is, that yes, the port is a lifeline to the city and obviously the economy of the country, uh, but in recent years, it's also become somewhat disconnected. And I try to maybe ground that in some of the sizes of economic flows um, that, that might provide an explanation to why that is. So to ground this, give us a little bit of background, and I know a lot of people are quite aware of this, but this, the numbers are staggering. This is a very recent snapshot of some economic metrics of the health of the economy in general, at least the intensity of economic activity, only from last year and this year. Right? And it's frightening, right? So on every measure that you choose, things are deplorably worse, right? Uh, poverty in only the span of a year has doubled, uh, extreme poverty tripled, uh, unemployment almost fourfold. So we are operating in, a, in an environment that is 
very crippled economically. So even as we try to imagine alternative futures for the, for the port and for its relationship to the city, at least in the short to medium term, we have to, be, we have to heed uh, the, the kind of collapse that the overall economy of the country is currently experiencing. And this to also say that 2019, we were already in recession. So the collapse starts before, but the free fall really is accelerated in the last year. In particular, I put in here imports and exports to try to one show the incredible reliance on import, really unhealthy reliance on import of the size of the economic flow of the country. So somewhere close to 40% of all the value that goes through the country in 2019 was imports, 40%. That's, this is down, this is part of what it means to collapse is we can't afford the imports anymore. Exports, relatively modest. Now, if we think of trade in general, export and import in value as a share of the size of our economic activity, which is this, what this real GDP is supposed to be uh, proxying, do we come out as a country that is very dynamic in trade? No, we're quite average. It's not, we don't stick out in any way. If you add import and export and scale that to real GDP, we're really non-distinct. Now, where's the port in all of this? Well, obviously, um, this is, uh, these are mostly happening through the port. In fact, about 70% of this trade is happening through the port. And so if we want to get a sense of what size of the, what share of the economic activity is going through the port overall, of the overall economic activity, it's about 20%. And this is after the collapse. This is in 2020. So it's a conduit for 20% of the value that gets exchanged in this economy. And that's huge. And so the interests around that are gonna be quite massive. There's another way of looking at this, which actually brings the explosion into the picture. And before I turn to that, note that these projections for 2020, most of them were calculated based on trends up to July. So the picture is gonna look even more dire moving forward. There's been in the explosion, we're in the midst of a second surge of COVID and on the eve of a, an upcoming lockdown. So things are actually gonna be even worse than, than this already pretty grim picture. But so the port, of the port of Beirut explosion happens in August. And again, to try to scale what it means in terms of importance in monetary value, this large establishment, which is the port, is about 7.4% of the estimated damages, physical damages of the overall explosion. So it's a relatively minimal share of physical damage that actually happened at the site of the port compared to the overall damage around it to all of the physical losses. Uh, but if we think of the associated losses in economic flows that are attributed to the explosion, that's about 3.2 billion. Uh, in fact, with the latest estimates of real GDP, that's about 10% of GDP, or close to 10% of GDP for this year, uh, which is, for, or maybe close to 8% of GDP for this year, uh, just because of the explosion. That's, that's terrifying. But how much of that lost activity was going to happen through the port? 645 million. That's about 20% again. So any way you look at it, it's a huge lifeline. Now, why has it receded? Why or why is it disconnected from our lives? Uh, not most of us are not traders, right? Most of us are not in uh, most many of the at least the panelists I know, and then I also suspect some of the attendees. We're not part of the um, segment of society that actually deals with this, and it's no surprise because it turns out if you look at our markets, and we haven't done a market study of concentration of businesses in a really long time, and we're long overdue for one. But the most recent one, which is from about 17 years ago, and so things have only gotten more concentrated since then. The most recent one from 17 years ago tells us that something like 36% of local markets, and they go through about almost 300 markets, so 300 um, markets for goods, right? So in about 36% of them, um, the biggest firm controls more than half the market. So we have extremely concentrated markets uh, of traders, 
Uh, so these numbers are very much uh, in the hands of very, very few um, with exclusive agencies, with import licenses, with overwhelming control of the, the market that they operate in. But typically, they operate in more than one market, more than one good. And that's part of why we don't actually experience the port as 20% of everything that all the economic activity that actually happens in, um, in our daily lives. Um, so yeah, with that, I think I've hit my three minutes and I will, I guess, open it up for a discussion. Thank you everyone for um, amazing food for thought. We're, we're gonna have a few minutes only to discuss for this question before we move to question two. Um, so uh, we, can we can have like three, four minutes, five minutes, please for the, uh, for, uh, for the audience, feel free to put your questions in the question and A and we'll try to integrate them as we go. And hopefully we, uh, if there are remaining questions, we, uh, we will have more time to discuss them uh, at the end as we uh, talked about before. Um, so feel free, whoever in the panelists want to ask questions or pu pu push this conversation forward, uh, feel free to do that before we move to questions. So for example, there's a question for you, Marwan, about can, we, can you please, uh, from um, one of the audience, can you please give some examples of how residents can have a hand in the reconstruction, some, some small scale planning of the damaged part of the city? Um, so this is one question, if you can take it, and then I'll go through the other ones. Okay, the, the short answer is no, but I will try to expand a little bit on it. Uh, the, there's uh, many more people on the ground that are much more aware of the conditions. I'm not in Beirut and I cannot claim that I can speak for the conditions there, but I can think of two things. One is uh, uh, at the risk of sounding uh, um, uh, neoliberal uh, long-term work for our collective as designers and planners to actually deregulate the urban regulation, actually, to make them out of commission in a way. It sounds too extreme, but I, I, I think they've never served the, the city and its population. So really releasing that thing and uh, uh, to move into a, a, a more uh, civil right uh, environment. The other is basically, I see that the role of planners and designers can be really fractured, like uh, the, think of to think of ourselves as citizens rather than the professionals and uh, actually connect to the issues we care about and we, we uh, connect to the group of people that we uh, 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 want to deal with, advocate for and provide you know, uh, channels uh, for funding to uh, support uh, certain initiatives, to, uh, uh, create studies that are relevant to uh, certain groups or certain people. And I don't see necessarily that our efforts need to be defined in one way as much as uh, really connecting to the issue and to what's happening on the ground and affiliate ourselves and use our uh, skills to actually uh, support and uh, push uh, issues that uh, we connect with among, uh, with the residents. That would be my best reaction to this. Thanks, Mara. There's a group of questions, actually, I will uh, put them together as a question about whether there's a necessity to have, to keep the, where is it important to keep the, uh, the port in Beirut or whether to move it somewhere else or whether Tripoli should take part of the uh, load that Beirut has been taking. Uh, I mean, there are like four questions related to that. And um, so maybe, um, maybe Rania and Nisreen can talk a little bit about that. I think there are questions that Nisreen was answering about the poverty rate, et cetera, live. You can probably mention them in case other people are curious about that too. These are fantastic questions of how do we imagine uh, the future of the port? And I think Nisreen uh, began to point uh, to possibilities in terms of diversification of, uh, of the economic role of the port uh, in that respect and thinking of possible complementary activities uh, and where would these pockets be in, in its current location. Uh, another possibility is to imagine uh, in a country where uh, national planning is still a possibility and probably Dean Sarkis might have more to say on that later. Um, how do we think of the location of the port as part of the major questions? Now, uh, when we think of that, we think of a, a, the recent history of the Lebanese civil war and the fantastic history of the 33 ports that emerged uh, during then. So where would, you, <laughs> where would you move the port to uh, is, is, a, is an interesting rabbit hole. And I think it's worth entertaining the question not least because it helps us point to some of the challenges of any deliberation process currently in Lebanon. Um, 
So uh, where would it move to? Would you move um, um, all of its role? Would you hold on to petroleum and grain exports because they're currently you know, centralized into a few ports, uh, cars as well, because there's, there's certain restrictions on customs. Uh, do you dissociate its cargo from its uh, uh, kind of uh, um, cruise uh, ship industry? And then what kind of visions of an economic redevelopment of the city would you hit if you, know, if you start to dissociate those? On the other hand, how do you kind of with clear conscience advocate for a reconstruction of a port with similar storage protocols when you know that uh, uh, such a proximity to the city center is, is, a, is a ticking bomb. So um, it's, a, it's a great question. And uh, I think, you know, it, it requires some, some careful considerations of how we can begin to think about, about those kinds of futures. Thanks, Rania. Mr. So um, this also I, maybe- Andreas, I mean, Andreas Sorry. probably- so, so maybe this ties it to some of the other questions that I that I've read in the Q and A box. Is um, given the current uh, power structure, one one of the things that is under consideration in the rehabilitation or the development of new infrastructure around ports is also the potential future oil and gas exploration uh, that is, you know, looming. Uh, and so that that is another massive infrastructure gamble uh, that we are embarking on, uh, as well as we decide uh, where to to fit um, uh, a port with refinery or with uh, re-export uh, for for uh, oil and gas. Um, Part, part of part of the other considerations also is uh, is more balanced investment and development in general with some attention going to Tripoli more recently partly because of the staggering poverty rates so I know that uh, there is interest at least from multilateral organizations the World Bank uh, various arms of the UN in devoting more time and attention to Tripoli whether that also involves, Rehabilitating the Tripoli or upgrading the Tripoli port, I've not heard, but um, but there's certainly more um, headlines around Tripoli these days. Yeah, I, w one very brief thing because uh, like one of the very the most difficult situations uh, that that not only Beirut but I think the the planet is facing is that the sense of urgency uh, tends to push to basically don't question the frame of uh, advanced capitalism in which we operate. Uh, and that's something that is a huge difficulty because basically at the same time that there's a need for very urgent uh, and rapid response to very dramatic situations, uh, that can only be challenged, though that, that sense of vulnerability if we transform the frame in which we operate. And that's something that takes much longer. So how do we uh, operate rapidly addressing issues that are uh, dramatic and require a sense of nowness. At the same time, that sense of nowness is identified as something that requires for us to change the, the kind of contract, social contract that we're part of. For me, this is, this is a radical difficulty that we face because it pushes for us to be in responding emergencies, perpetuating a system that is really the cause of those emergencies. And that requires intellectual, cultural, political articulation. The, the discussion of harbors tend to be constructed in terms of uh, inter, kind of inter-harbor uh, competition, in terms of how, much, how, how they attract uh, investment, how, how much trading can, and circulation can they attract. How do we change that into something that could be more of a trans-regional alliance that would provide a bettering of the entire region uh, in, in the terms that, that basically are the cause of this emergency that we're discussing. Thank you, everyone. Um, hopefully, as I said before, there's so, so many questions out, uh, in the chat and we are also very curious about more about the port. As we said, this hopefully is just the foundation uh, for future conversations. So given that, we're gonna move to question two. Thank you for the panelists for question one, number one and Aya, please take the floor. Thank you, everyone. Great, um, thank you. So my name is Aya Abdullah and I'm a, a Mark student, a current MRC student here at GSAP. 
And the second question is, in recent years, digital media, including alternative news reporting, counter mapping, digital humanities, has played a pivotal role in uprisings and mass movements in Lebanon and globally. What new forms could digital media and soft infrastructures take in shaping alternative socioeconomic and political spheres outside the existing systems in Lebanon, while taking into consideration the limited physical infrastructure available? And how can we start thinking about soft infrastructure provisions in terms of funding, educational setups, and perhaps global networks of support? So first, I'd like to ask this question to Habib Haddad, Laura Kurgan, Manan Ahmed, and Jean Asir, but then we can open it to the rest of the panelists for a discussion. Thank you, Aya. Um, so, you know, in the, in the past year, um, as Lebanon has been going through all the stress tests, um, something occurred to me. I realized something, uh, an amazing social phenomenon is happening in Lebanon, and that's what I call the on-demand formation of communities. So you've been having communities who come together, form, and then dissociate but every time there's a stress test that's happening. So we've seen, we see that happening obviously online through the social media tools. And I see that with my own friends. There's, there's friends that I call my activist friends or my fighting against something friends that I only get to talk to every, every time something happens. And that got me thinking, um, you know, we, these are, it almost feels like in your immunity system uh, kicking in when you get, when you get sick. Uh, but it got me thinking also about communities. I've been thinking about communities for a long time. And the way I think about, about building communities is in three buckets, communities of purpose, of action, and of interest. And purpose in this case is clear. People come together to fight against something, against corruption, against uh, economical you know, um, uh, collapse. Um, but, um, but it's very hard to move that against something to for something. And the other two parts actually help you, help you move there. So the second part I think of it is communities of interest. And this is also where, where online tools and kind of you know, today, today's technology can help. Um, so when you think of these um, uh, communities of interest, we think of education, but we also think of uh, leveraging the diaspora potentially for mentorship or for matching. And honestly, we also think of creating role models locally. When we look at the today, I would say one of the main culprits in Lebanon's uh, demise or current kind of you know demise is the the TV stations. Um, I think when you look at the soap operas, how mind-numbing they are, and the talk shows, how polarizing they are. But we don't see anyone. We don't see people talking about some of the local you know role models, the great uh, success stories that are coming out from Lebanon, maybe staying in Lebanon, maybe maybe moving out of Lebanon. So I think that that's really important to think about: uh, creating these role models, activating nodes, uh, inspiring others to follow suit. And um, the other thing is when we think about communities of, of purpose, of, of action, this is where we start thinking about um, infrastructure, uh, more hard infrastructure. So the communities of action is when we bring these people together in a place and we start creating a serendipitous connection where we can actually come up with creative ideas and solutions and maybe create kind of industries. Uh, so this is today you've seen spaces in, in Beirut, actually like Beirut Digital District, uh, which is actually a pretty amazing uh, space um, near in Bashura. Uh, that has integrated within the community, but allowed also a group of um, young entrepreneurs and tech entrepreneurs to come and, and, and flourish. Uh, you've, you've seen stuff happening, obviously, also on campuses, specifically at AUB. Um, and, 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 you know, the, the Committee of Action is somehow the easiest, but the toughest. It's the easiest because it's known what we need to do to actually activate a community and create a, a create an economy. But it's also hard because to get there, it actually takes a lot of effort. It takes to change a culture, it takes to change behavior. And also on the, on the community of action part, uh, the other thing to think about is how to basically uh, create a path to scale. So it's great that we are able to uh, bring these communities online and start thinking about uh, solutions that, that, that they can solve, whether it's their social entrepreneurs, whether they're for-profit entrepreneurs, whether they're artists, but how can we can help scale their impact? And that, that comes in through, again, known mechanisms, whether through its investing or through market policies, et cetera. Now, um, the optimist in me always wants to find positive news uh, in anything. And today, as depressing as the situation is in Lebanon, I think there is definitely a moment today, an opportunity where we can look at these moments that are created through uh, communities of purpose of being against something and try to move to, move, to transform them into movements, long lasting movements. And you know, it, it actually it does work. I have been, I've seen it, I've been part of it. Um, I saw it work uh, for maybe, 
about four or five years from 2011 to 2016, where we saw kind of a really uh, abundance of uh, energy and creativity. And we've seen even some interesting uh, investment mechanisms, whether it's from uh, international um, uh, uh, folks like the World Bank and, and EBRD and the EIBs, also, or even locally, like the 331 circular that came from, from the central bank at some point. Um, and, but, but you know, obviously many of those um, uh, are, are not anymore, um, uh, uh, not surviving, but I think there's definitely a quite opportune time to move it. I think the main thing is that, uh, unfortunately, we're seeing a hemorrhaging of talent um, and it's whether we want to embrace that and help this talent succeed elsewhere with a anticipation that we're going to have a revolving door as things stabilize or whether we're going to work to stop that hemorrhaging. Thank you. Uh, Laura, next. Um, hi, everyone. And um, Habib, I, I'm really happy to follow on uh, to what you're saying, because I have some similar, um, similar ideas, but not necessarily based in Beirut. Um, so first of all, I, you know, I just want to say I left um, Beirut on the very day that the economic protest started in October. Um, and I think it's the last international flight I was on uh, prior to the pandemic. I think I did some travel within the United States after that, but so Beirut, <laughs> um, I miss Beirut. And, um, and also um, it, within that meeting and uh, Mona um, Fawaz was the one um, who invited me and it was also through Hibber's <coughs> um, Ford Fund Foundation grant, I met, um, an incredible group of, um, act, of activist mappers. And the reason I was there was because there was actually not even um, a three-dimensional model of Beirut, um, which is so common in the United States and the way that we have access to open data just doesn't um, exist in Beirut. And that was uh, part of our collaboration. So I don't know where that project is right now, but maybe Mona can talk to it later. Um, but just to follow on what Habib was saying, you know, I've been writing um, a lot lately about um, the structure and design of networks and the echo chambers and polarizations they built, they build um, because of the ways in which they are designed. Um, you know, so because um, our social media is designed so that advertising can be directly um, directed to me. Because of that, all kinds of other political agents can also direct um, messages to me. And that's how all the filter bubbles exist that all of us have so much difficulty of getting out, out of. Um, following that, so that was an article about an algorithm called homophily. Um, and then uh, after that, I've just finished something, and both of these are on eFlex, if you want to look, is, is more about um, weak ties. And although that algorithm was also based in a history of um, segregation, the ways in which you can activate ties um, across difference is something that we could reinforce as a way to redesign our networks um, in other ways. And so I know that that sounds very abstract. So Maybe I'll just bring it to the ground um, by uh, telling you about a seminar that I'm teaching right now on public interest technology, which Aya is in, and I hope she will agree that we're making some real headway um, over there. And our students are being asked, you know, public interest technology is usually defined as technology in the public interest. Well, that doesn't help very much. Um, and what we've been trying to get our students to ask is, which publics um, are included and excluded um, by technology. And so most importantly, we're asking sort of how to design and build and control and govern with new communication systems. And this is actually a quite utopian thing that we're asking our, our students to do with various um, levels of success that telling them, you know, technology should be built to fit communities or should be built to adapt to communities rather than the networks in which we're, um, we're operating within today. And so within that, and there's a lot of projects, but I'll just um, foreground one of them um, 
because it's through an organization that's um, that started by another one of GSEP's um, Columbia called Community Tech NYC. And so some of our students are working with them to design um, uh, public interest technology in Appalachia um, in, in Tennessee and in, in the United States. And what they're doing is building uh, very low tech hardware and software um, and almost, you know, sort of creating um, a curated internet that is specific to the local community. And once you edit out, you know, the whole of the internet and um, address something to specific communities, you can actually allow them to, to establish peer-to-peer -peer networks where they can communicate, as um, Habib is saying, in on-demand on -demand communities. And then once you do that, you can actually foster a way of learning both hardware and software and teaching people how to create their own networks and then perhaps slowly build up towards a larger version of the internet. So anyway, I think that's my intervention. I do think that in these contexts, um, you know, of extreme emergencies and of, you know, so much disinformation, we really need to take back our networks and try um, to, to, build, to rebuild them um, in different ways while acknowledging the, the, the deep history. You know, at the same time, I find out about what I found out about what happened in Beirut on Facebook, and I hate Facebook. But that is where all my friends who are gathered on the screen, I'm, I connect with them on either Facebook or Twitter. So I often find out about things through those networks rather than through, you know, the New York Times, which nowadays is only, only, only about the, you know. Um, the elections. I just found out today from one of my students in Lima, Peru, that the uh, president there has just been impeached and there's huge violence on the on the streets of Lima. I would I did not find that out from, you know, my my news networks. So thank you, Laura. Okay. Uh, Manan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hiva, and uh, thank you, Laila. And thank you, GSAP, for at first uh, holding this really important and um, enlightening conversation and for inviting me to be a part of it. Um, I wanted to say a couple of things that are building upon uh, Habib's and Laura's points in terms of communities and networks um, and kind of reflect on two of my experiences uh, working after disaster. Uh, one was in 2005 earthquake in uh, Kashmir and Pakistan that displaced uh, at least a couple of hundred thousand people. Um, and and um, I, I, if I remember correctly, um, had something like 80, 90,000 fatalities. And part of our mobilization that happened uh, as a result of that earthquake um, taught a lot to me, at least as a, as a graduate student, on what um, uh, some, some good things in the sense of um, lo-fi infrastructure, creating communities that are uh, gathered around, as Habib was saying, an emergency response, mutual aid networks um, that allowed for new types of solidarities to emerge, um, and also thinking about domestic and regional contacts in a new way outside of the kind of political formations or um, you know, the ways in which um, affiliations really, um, really work. Much of that work was done through listservs and through phones this is again 2005. Um, the 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 I'll I'll come back to the bad points later, bad lessons later. Um, and then further in 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 2017, uh, af in the aftermath of Hurricane uh, Maria, we did a, a work here at Columbia uh, for Puerto Rico, um, thinking about mapping. Uh, did a, a mapathon and and uh, again cre creating some of these mutual aid uh, networks. Um, this time through WhatsApp, uh, etc. And again, we did a lot of thinking about what lo-fi networks look like, uh, how to do multimodal and multinodal types of connections. Um, and as uh, our collective was interested in archiving, um, how do we kind of have a repository of knowledge that we can uh, turn back to? Uh, Laura mentioned three-dimensional mapping, um, but you know we can think of all kinds of things, in including uh, food repositories, including um, uh, first, first care health uh, repositories. 
So how do we kind of conceptualize these types of aid, aid through mutual aid networks, but how do we archive that knowledge so uh, people continue to rely on its, its abundance? Um, some of these uh, ways in which we can think of creating these uh, uh, mutual aid networks um, in, in, during the COVID um, uh, era have been um, utilized by my colleagues, both in South Asia, um, in India, specifically um, as the, uh, the uh, how do I say it, forced migration as a result of lockdown happened that uh, forced uh, the dispossessed and the working um, poor to, to actually leave their uh, environments, their work environments in, in Northern India and Delhi and, and travel by foot thousands of miles. And so how to kind of think about these kinds of efforts, these kinds of uh, emergencies through uh, lo-fi or through um, a distributed channel of, of, of activity. Um, there are clear ways forward in those, um, and there are many, many, many of my colleagues in these, this conversation today who are much, much better experts at this. But I wanted to actually highlight some of the things that I learned in my experiences that are, are negative. And, and I want to start with uh, what happened at the end of uh, aftermath of the 2005 earthquake and our efforts to um, rebuild uh, communities, efforts to re literally rebuild houses um, and think about architecture, um, especially um, non-urban architecture in a, in, a, in a new way through sustainable uh, techniques uh, going back, in fact, going back thousands of years in, in Cholistan and in Thar and Sin. Um, and what, do we, we, what I learned was that the attention, the international aid and the NGO attention dwindles um, as soon as the news cycle dwindles. And in its aftermath, uh, what we saw in the late 2000s in, in Pakistan was the rise of what we now call in retrospect, the land mafias. Uh, and the land mafias basically were able to repurpose much of the work that we had done or had hoped to do um, and created uh, a, a very, very extensive land holdings through, from which there was forced migration and displacement of the farmers and the villagers. Um, these are already displaced people who had been put in um, precarious uh, financial and obviously um, uh, precarious to their life uh, situations. So the, the, the hyper displacement and dispossession that followed in 2007, eight, nine, um, prompts us to kind of think about how in the, in the wake of disasters, uh, as we do emergency relief, um, how do we think about the populations that are dispossessed to begin with, that are under the radar to begin with, uh, everything from informal economies um, to infrastructures of support, that a middle class or an upper middle class or an industry um, that requires cheap uh, expendable labor relies upon. Um, and as we think about disasters, um, how do we encourage, encourage ourselves to rethink the, the, the target populations, the, those who um, demand relief at the, at the utmost, not just in the moments after, but long-term. And I think it goes back to, um, um, I think it was Marwan in the first panel, kind of thinking about maybe civic rights that need to be reimagined in the wake of the disaster. But I would actually um, maybe uh, extend that and say the idea of the civic itself must be reimagined. We need to reimagine who gets to be constituted in the category of civic. Um, whether they are, and, and again, speaking from the perspective of Pakistan, uh, a lot of the conversation ended up being where the, the people who uh, make their livelihood from farming or from, uh, um, you know, uh, animal husbandry were not considered to be part of the civic. Um, they were dispossessed uh, as well as uh, easily displaced, and they don't have political recognition. And the political landscape is, in fact, uh, grounded upon um, in erasing uh, their subjectivities. So how do we as activists, as academics, as architects, as historians, as digital uh, infrastructure folks, how do we kind of think about um, these particular individuals? And there are, um, I can assure you, just as many in Beirut as there were in, in Pakistan. Um, and how do we build a, a new mutual aid networks 
that do not do the same type of inequity that have been part of the pre-disaster, pre-earthquake, pre-blast. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Beautiful, Manan. Thank you, Jean. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me and thanks for organizing this very timely discussion. Uh, I'm going to focus more on a case study, which is basically Megaphone, which is the media platform I'm, I'm running with, with a bunch of comrades and friends. Uh, but first, I'd like to talk about the question of infrastructure in a, in a rather explicit way. So, uh, I mean, today, 100 days after uh, the, the explosion and a year after the revolution, uh, there is a paradox that I'm just going to state the obvious, which is this huge mismatch between the fact that we have one at the level of idea and framing basically the political situation and framing the fact that we are facing a regime and that this regime needs to be toppled and cannot be reformed and basically putting together the different elements, the economic, the clientelist, the political in depicting uh, basically that regime. And we have failed miserably in holding it accountable in making uh, major political wins. And I mean, something that has come again uh, every time we were discussing this, is the lack of political infrastructure prior to the big opportunity that was October 17, which is the absence of political party, the absence of syndicates that were basically, would have been able potentially to materialize uh, people's interest into uh, proper roadmaps and, and, and mobilize uh, uh, people. So what you also realize is that it's extremely hard to build those infrastructure in crisis mode. So those infrastructure, a few of them, uh, Megaphone being one of them, existed prior to that, uh, prior to the uprising, prior to that opportunity. And I believe that, I mean, at the media level, Megaphone, in addition to other uh, platforms, have contributed somehow to bridge that asymmetry that we have with, uh, with, with the regime in place. So three years ago, when we started, uh, I mean, traditional media was still overwhelmingly dominating the narrative, dominating who gets represented, who gets a voice uh, in uh, the public conversation. Uh, a big chunk of the population was also alienated from the public conversation, the youth particularly. Uh, and that was due both to the fact that these traditional media, uh, in terms of their approach, in terms of their interest, but also in terms of how they dealt with the emerging and new technologies, was obsolete by all means. So we saw it as an opportunity as political activists. None of us was journalists by training or uh, even by practice. Uh, and we saw that there was a window basically uh, to change hats and to start developing that media platform. Uh, it started as a Facebook page and like everybody else in the region, a phenomenon that started in 2011, we decided to subvert those tools uh, and to basically transform them into political platform and eventually professionalize that uh, that transformation to have a full-fledged media that can exist on those platforms. Uh, so Megaphone uh, managed three years later to uh, basically like, provide a key role and pivotal role also in, in, in this uprising in documenting, in deconstructing official narratives in informing and breaking down information, but in also uh, providing platform for marginalized groups, uh, migrant workers, the LGBT community, refugees, and so on, to have a place in this conversation. Uh, and I'd like to talk a bit about how this came into being because, I mean, one of the main reasons why those political, mediatic, syndical infrastructure didn't exist was a matter of resources and also a matter of, I mean, means. So when we started, uh, as I said, there wasn't the expertise necessarily, uh, and also we didn't go about it in a very didactic way. So uh, we were uh, driven by uh, impact, so we thought about it more as a political project using the tools and also the ethics of, of, of journalism. Uh, and also we uh, thought about it as a sort of an open lab, uh, in a sense that we threw those videos on Facebook and then they picked up and then we find them. But everybody who was joining this project, uh, from uh, the designers to uh, people who are, have uh, sort of knowledge and user experience and media, were bringing their, their, their own additions. Uh, even business-wise, it wasn't a project that made any sense. It was a project that was volunteer run and based uh, to a large extent. Uh, and um, basically with time was able to just get professionalized and to, uh, yeah, I'm asked to wrap up. Sorry, I took too long. Uh, j just to add basically in terms of the sustainability of that model, uh, more and more uh, Megaphone is trying to uh, sort of uh, bridge uh, the, the gap between us as a media entity and the different knowledge producing entities. So a lot of people who are actually on this panel are some of our partners in terms of 
producing and mainstreamizing uh, some of the work that they've been doing through videos and through those different tools. Uh, also, uh, in terms of sustainability, in terms of funding, we're much more going into a community-led uh, and community-funded uh, form of, of journalism uh, and trying to withdraw progressively from just the media development uh, sphere that wouldn't allow us to be sustainable for, for a very long time. Sorry if I took too long. That's all right. Thank you, John. Thank you for a megaphone. Too. Uh, um, so we have several questions in the chat. As, as you can imagine, with, with, with managing such a big uh, event, uh, we need to uh, be, uh, be careful with the time. So I'm just going to uh, put the, uh, group the questions into two main concerns. First, uh, how to think about the infrastructure, the soft infrastructure that's needed in a country like Lebanon, where like with the socioeconomic and political situation, but also um, how, um, how can we cultivate uh, the soft infrastructure so that it speaks to the multiplicity of communities in Beirut without perpetuating exclusionary barriers such as criticism, patriotism, capitalism, I guess sectarianism too. So this is a general question. The other, the other group of questions is related to the gentrification that something like the Beirut design uh, BDD has generated. Uh, so, um, so while thinking about soft infrastructure and supporting IT, how can we think about, for example, something like um, uh, the implication for gentrification that this is causing um, um, to the surrounding neighborhoods? Uh, and in this case, uh, this is a question for Habib. Thank you. Uh, you want me to go first, Heba? You can go first, yes. Yeah, so I actually just answered the question on BDD. Um, uh, just from from what I know is that they've been actually quite <coughs> conscious about hiring the local community into their own staff and have been investing in education and in schools around them. So I think I, I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't have uh, other comparisons. I'll leave that to the architects uh, in the group to talk more about it. But from what I've seen from a community perspective, I think I see them integrate quite well. To the question on government, in fact, um, that's a great question. But in fact you don't want government engagement in creating communities. In fact, government engagement is what messes up communities. And you've seen that happen in some parts of the Gulf where they want to, you've seen like big headlines, creating the new city of economic development for the next hundred startups or creating the blah, 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 whatever. And more often than not, these end up becoming empty shells or real estate projects that don't really see active communities. Communities bubble up. Uh, think of it as the souk, the traditional souk that uh, emerges in a city like Beirut or Damascus, or think of like an empty mall that is built top down with a really ugly, you know, just kind of uh, hallways and walking. That's kind of the analogy I would think about, about that. Now, government is important to create infrastructures like the internet or to allow uh, the smooth um, um, policies. But honestly, I've had a company with 40 people in Beirut and I can say this on the record now because I'm not there anymore, but we didn't even have the mom. I mean, I'm not saying this is a good thing. I'm saying that the rules are there, but also you don't have to follow the rules when, I mean, I didn't, okay. I have, to, I have to give a, so not, not follow, you can create your own rules basically, right? So meaning you, you don't need to get bogged down by government bureaucracy. And more often than not, uh, in Lebanon, you can do that. Um, I don't uh, uh, vouch for doing that on a Daman level, but you can do that, set, set up, operate. The one thing I'd like to leave you with, and I'd like to come maybe to research on that question, is the monopoly game. Uh, monopoly, when it first it was invented, on the question of capitalism, uh, was had a, 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 a rule such that it was actually, I think, was more of a rentier kind of uh, uh, rules. And, you want, and, and over time, it actually evolved to become a capitalistic game. And what you saw in this game, in this particular sector, is actually you didn't have to ch change much of the systems there. You had to change the goal, the outcome, the rule. And then when you did that, the whole culture of monopoly changed a lot. So it's really just about changing the rules and the, and the goals you're going to go after which can actually change a lot in terms of whether you're capitalistic or, or on the other side as well. Okay, thank you, Habib. So we're gonna move in the interest of time to question three, please. Uh, from now on, actually all the question and answer we'll, we'll discuss at the end. So please let's move to question three. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, panelists for question two, uh, amazing discussion. Um, yes, please the collective take the floor. Thank you all. My name is Charles Hajj, I'm a GSEP alumni and I'll be asking a third question. So the explosion damaged over 250,000 residential units. The blast has highlighted the long-standing housing crisis and social spatial inequalities of the city that has been for long dominated by a financialization strategy of housing that is profit-oriented, developer, and banker, banker, bank center. A context where affordable forms of housing are close to non-existent, while rental options for housing that are the most affordable forms are being dismantled. 
This housing problematic also intersects with the international NGOization of all aspects of the built environment in a city deemed a republic of NGOs. The situation has ignited a critical debate on how these non-governmental actors will shape the public interest and promote residents-centered participation in housing recovery. Given this, how can we rethink housing and land policies, building and zoning laws, housing production, as well as rental markets, while simultaneously thinking about the social fabric, socioeconomic crisis, and ecological urgencies that loom over the city? So Abir Saksu, Rana Samara, Karim Namur, and Ziyal Jamaluddin will take the lead, and then we'll move on to the next question. We'll start with Abir. Uh, thank you, everybody. And hello. Um, I will just first start by putting some of the state policies towards housing in, in historical context. And to understand them historically, we can, uh, we can understand them along three stages. Um, the first was exemplified by sporadic laws to rent control uh, and housing interventions in response to disasters. This was mainly uh, the pre-1960s period. From the early 60s to the 90s, we witnessed a, a marginal housing policy hinting, at, hinting a little bit at the right to housing and the establishment of some housing institutions. But it also missed on any comprehensive and integrated vision to achieve the right to decent housing uh, for all uh, constituents of society. And which this brings us to the last 20 years, um, where the little fair housing legislations that were in place were abolished or made ineffective. And the new housing policy was an essential part of a system based on serving the interests of capital, uh, a policy based on home ownership through loans uh, sponsored by the central bank in service of its monetary policy. Uh, it primarily uh, benefited banks and investors under the pretext of the sanctity of private property and at the expense of city dwellers. Um, so as a result, residents today are in a constant crisis, uh, suffering from inadequate and undignified housing conditions. No one actually records this slow violence and households across all factions of society are left alone to face such housing violations. As such, um, Public Works Housing Monitor has been monitoring evictions, uh, reading them as a citywide condition and responding to them. Uh, as an example, from September, from the beginning of, of September to mid-October, we tracked 58 cases of threatened evictions affecting almost 200 people in Beirut. The largest numbers of, uh, of these threats was in Carantina, a marginal neighborhood heavily damaged by the blast. In short, there's a, there's a need for comprehensive housing demands that put these struggles at the forefront of public debate and that, of course, try to disrupt the dominant notion that land is at the service of a rentier economy. Uh, equally important for rethinking housing and land policies is to actually rethink the role of city dwellers in this process. Um, in the neighborhoods damaged by the blast, residents have actually been made absent from discussions around reconstruction. They're also being dealt with individually, merely as re recipients of aid, uh, this has been practiced uh, from all uh, across uh, private and uh, public actors on the ground. Um, residents also witnessed the involvement of sectarian parties in the renovation eff efforts, which fed uh, into clientelistic relations at the expense of collective rights. So also in public works, we're conducting neighborhood meetings with the aim of building a residence association through which residents can reinstate their voices, their collective concerns, and their control over the renovation of their homes. We firmly believe that it is only through such a framework, such a representative and organizational framework, that we can start to make housing claims and land claims and actually reverse the, the effects of financialization that the neighborhoods had been subjected to. Thank you, Abiy Arana. Um, I'm going to share with you today the experience uh, uh, Musana, the NGO, we established just in the 20 So it's uh, a very young NGO that I'm going to share the experience of um, on the ground uh, post Beirut blast. So the NGOization is a new term that, of course, has uh, uh, come to fruition post Beirut blast mainly. And in the absence, almost rejection and in defiance, actually, of the government, 
not only by the people, but also by donors. It's non-governmental agencies, initiatives and civil society as a whole that has stepped in to fill the many gaps that have left behind by the incompetent governance. So NGOs have been almost forced to build capacity, migrate private sector and academic experience, expertise to contribute to the ongoing process of reconstructing the city. Um, so intuitively at first, at a humanitarian level, it was a question of relief. So from the day after the blast, of course, we are all aware of the, of the uh, feet on the ground, the cleaning of the streets, and it was really very intuitive, uh, very sporadic uh, and very unstructured, which got things going quickly. So uh, then came the challenge of transform and transforming leaf work to reconstruction work. And this is really what, which was the fine line and the transition that was not acknowledged that relief work for the first period cannot uh, transcend automatically into reconstruction. And yes, there was little uh, process or thought uh, invested in um, this transition to reconstruction. So the two phases were simply merged uh, and in the absence of a legal framework, despite the many efforts and the parties who were uh, at the beginning involved in trying to uh, regulate uh, uh, structure um, the process, uh, it obviously did not, um, it failed in coming through. So there's a, a total absence of a legal framework for reconstruction, a total absence of, of urban planning, of strategic thinking, um, and there's an ongoing sporadic coordination um, and collaboration on the ground. So this disconnect between the reality on the ground and the higher level, if you want, of participatory approach, of structuring, of legality, is all coming together on the ground. Uh, um, and these challenges are counterbalanced, if you want, by the ongoing fantastic energy of the people, of civil society. And um, it's not only the people who are on the ground and in Beirut, but also the many expats around the world that have come together in the age of the digital um, a platform who have contributed uh, to this uh, dialogue, to this reconstruction effort, not only in terms of providing the expertise, but also the much needed funds that have channeled um, uh, primarily through NGOs, uh, whereby the donors have almost refused to funnel money through uh, more public entities or institutions for the lack of trust. So the NGOs have been put in a position whereby they have to uh, step up uh, to fill that gap and um, play the role from everything from a design consultant to fund uh, or grant manager to um, implementing partner on the ground. Uh, so this the, and there, there's this ongoing dichotomy of urgency versus sustainable intervention. Uh, so we're working under sort of a post Beirut context where there is an urgency and every day the urgency grows to actually intervene and rehabilitate and bring people back to their homes. And this, this urgency is um, uh, prohibits, if you want, the more the, the, the luxury of thinking uh, further, more strategically, uh, where we are still working with a mandate to, um, to um, relieve human. Um, so at Nusanid, our target, for instance, is 2050 commercial and residential units. And with that, we have a turnover of 50 units weekly. So um, to date, we've uh, completed 700 units, 900 are under rehabilitation. So the pace of work and the scale of operations is gigantic. And, uh, with, um, and this happens, of course, with a, a team, a great team of uh, 25 small to medium sized contractors of an in-house team of experts of um, uh, contractors ranging from experts in historic um, restoration to those uh, more specialized in food and beverage where we've um, committed to uh, supporting uh, rehabilitation of restaurants in Marim Khayil and the scale of the neighborhood glass supplier. So our investment in rehabilitation is not an investment only in, uh, in rebuilding the stone, but really, and this is where the emphasis should be, is that we are reinvesting in, a, in revitalize, revitalizing a socioeconomic cycle, which ironically and sadly has been moved by the blast. The construction industry is booming in Beirut, obviously. 
uh, experts from all over uh, Lebanon are actually uh, coming into Beirut to provide their ex expertise, their volunteer work, and it's really a fantastic spirit. Um, so in the meantime, as an NGO, you're not only building capacity, up, uh, managing a huge operation on the ground, but you're also going digital to aggregate data, to visualize it, to, to share it transparently with donors and partners, and continue the ongoing raising of funds um, for, for different needs. Um, within that context, I'll stop. I have two, two, two uh, points. Uh, we're still working with the shelter sector, and I know we will continue to work on that. The shelter sector is already in dire straits, so the policy of bring back better is a challenge in itself. Um, and the funds, uh, I just want to touch on that. There's a need to diversify donor investment uh, beyond the, sh the strict shelter understanding um, and to go to historic preservation, SMEs, and to livelihoods. Thank you. Thank you, Rana. Sorry. <laughs> Again, I hope this is just the beginning of a, a future conversation. Uh, Karim and then Ziad. Thank you, uh, Hiba. I'm going to try to be brief. I'm going to introduce myself because you forgot to introduce me at the beginning of the session. Uh, I'm Karim Amour. I'm a lawyer, a researcher, a board member of the Legal Agenda, and uh, the host of the Kanini podcast. Oh, I'm just I yes, you do. Well, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I'm going to try to be very brief. So I'm going to go through an overview of housing policies in Lebanon and then specifically speak about what happened after the blast. Um, as an overview, we can already say that there's an, uh, uh, a clear evidence that the state is progressively disappearing when it comes to housing policies, uh, leaving basically uh, doing a de facto privatization of the sector, uh, whether by private companies or even privatization by NGO. Um, but <clears throat> to speak about the background, I'm going to mention three patterns that we see when evaluating housing policies in Lebanon. So basically, the first one is uh, a perverted uh, 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 concept of what housing policies are, because uh, Abiy spoke about this. There, there's this sacralization of uh, uh, the right to property. And basically, the Lebanese uh, uh, government, the Lebanese uh, authorities, view the right uh, to property as the main component of the right to housing. And there are two separate things, unrelated at all, but the sacralization of the right to property made it so that most housing policies are property oriented, financial, uh, uh, contributing to the financial uh, markets, and the objectives are targeted towards encouraging real estate investment uh, uh, and complete um, uh, uh, disregard to the right to housing. This brings us to the second pattern, which is uh, uh, if housing policies existed, they are thus classist and discriminatory because uh, this is evidenced by three decades of encouraging basically real estate loans because housing is understood as owning property in Lebanon, not as being a rentee or, uh, or having affordable housing or social housing, etc. So uh, uh, encouraging real estate loans also means lack of affordable housing to people who cannot get loans. And they're uh, also not taking into, taking into consideration two, three main factors. So the increase in living conditions and in the cost of uh, living in Lebanon and not linking this at all to either rents or salaries. So basically we, there is no rent control uh, the, the minimum wage is uh, dire compared to the cost of living, and they are neither intertwined nor connected, and this is very problematic, and this is why it creates a policy that is classist and uh, discriminatory. Third pattern, before I move to something more specific, is the fact that the house policies themselves are illegal, most of them, not either the regulation, and this is evidenced by one, the fact that building laws themselves are not being respected. For instance, when the Ministry of uh, Interior grants municipalities the right to issue a construction permits against, uh, in violation of the, uh, the building law, they also do not respect uh, urbanism law and uh, uh, um, uh, master plans that were established either in regions or the, the general master plan that was established in Lebanon that I would come back to later because it's actually very interesting. And so basically the right uh, uh, to property doesn't, uh, uh, is, is sacralized to a degree where people uh, seem to believe that 
they have the right to dispose of their property as they wish. This is what I mean when I say that the general master plan is not respected, master plans are not respected, uh, because there are no limitations as to how you use your property. So this is another level of perversion of the right to property, doing whatever you want with your property, and by, and by this violating basically uh, uh, urbanism laws and master plans. Third violation is the constitution itself, because the right to property was so much sacralized that basically the right to housing was ignored, and the right to social justice were ignored. So these are basically the two first patterns. The third one is the complete absence of an ecological approach to housing, whether in, uh, in terms of the type of land, the use of the land, cultural heritage, the social fabric, and the historical background. And we've seen this before the Beirut blast. We, we've seen it in the Manchayel region, to give a concrete example, that was progressively gentrified. Manchayel is a region that is mainly in, the, in its social fabric uh, made of um, working class forces, old rents. So it, it was an area that, that uh, was shocked through gentrification uh, either by development of pubs, restaurants, uh, the culture of Caribbean rents. So it really increased rents there uh, uh, and basically created this uh, like an incarnation of the absence of a logical approach. This brings me to Beirut blast, the response to the Beirut blast. And basically, the main response was uh, that the law, the, uh, the parliament issued a very speedy law that reproduced all of these patterns. That is the law for the protection of areas affected by the Beirut blast. Um, I've already spoken about the background of the areas that were affected. And what we saw when we read the law recently, because it was published at the end of this uh, September, uh, is that it basically, even though it, it withheld uh, uh, real estate operations in the area and stipulated for compensation for the inhabitants, however, it did not forbid construction permits for real estate companies, for Solidaire, for instance, for empty lots, for instance. Uh, it did not uh, control eventual buildings that may arise and how they may arise, would they be coherent with the uh, uh, milieu that they are built in or not? The exemption uh, in terms of building to those uh, uh, um, actors basically will also affect the market price of the area and therefore uh, uh, um, uh, uh, be completely incoherent with the history of the area. Uh, Furthermore, there was very little uh, protection for cultural heritage buildings that exist in the area. So for instance, uh, it, it does not stipulate what uh, cultural uh, or historical building is. So it's basically left to a very short list of buildings that are uh, uh, um, mentioned and at, the at the level of the Ministry of Culture that would be protected. Whereas others that may very well have a lot of cultural significance or historical significance would not be protected because they are not on that list. Uh, furthermore, again, no, uh, there was absolutely no mention about rent control. So a lot of people who are living there will continue paying rents without any control. Adding to this factor what Nisreen mentioned uh, earlier in terms of economic collapse that uh, the, the country saw, uh, what also was mentioned in terms of the pandemic and uh, its effects on either the economy or on living conditions, we still haven't seen to this day any law related to rent control. This goes to show how the government, how the parliament, how legislators view housing in Lebanon. Renting is not viewed as a consequence of the right to housing. The right to housing is only viewed as the right to property and the right to dispose of your pro property the way you want, given the many exemptions we've seen and the violations of the law we've seen even on governmental level. I will end on this note because I can see that yeah, I'm going to end. We so basically, <laughs> two, two, two notes. The fact that only the, the area protected by the 2020 law were the Saifi, Irmail, uh, Mdawar, and Port areas, excluding other areas where only residents get damages but do not get protected in terms of building and reconstruction, shows that this also has a sectarian approach to it, because basically the only areas that were protected were mainly uh, uh, inhabited by uh, uh, Christian communities in Beirut. So this is what pushed us to call this law a form of real estate sectarianism, basically. And this is my final note. So 
basically what we've seen either with the pandemic or with the Beirut blast is the development of disaster capitalism and the fact that state is being completely absent in it. However, disaster capitalism doesn't need to be something very bad. We can also use it to rethink how we want the spaces, either housing or work or public spaces, to be re re reconstructed in a way that would profit public in interest rather than private interest. I will end it here and leave the rest for the discussion. Thank you, Karim, again, sorry, Ziad. Yes, hi, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. And I would like to thank also my colleagues uh, on this panel for contextualizing uh, the question of housing uh, in Beirut today. Um, also, um, it's nice to see everyone, and I hope uh, our friends and colleagues in Beirut are doing okay, considering everything. Uh, in the few minutes that I have, uh, I will try to lay out three provocations uh, to outline a potential affordable housing strategy that might address uh, issues beyond the immediate humanitarian needs that have been uh, triggered by the explosion. Uh, so I'll go straight into it. Uh, the first provocation, I would probably title it New Housing Typology, Infrastructure and Construction System, poses design thinking as the drive to imagine new affordable housing while engaging with larger systems. Addressing the high need for urban housing increases the city's density. Architects should leverage this as an opportunity to address failing urban infrastructure, asking how an alternative shared and, and, and localized infrastructure can potentially imagine new models of collectivity and public space. With the absence of the state, as has been noted, design investigation could also imagine multiple potential project stakeholders to support these initiatives by basically exploring housing unit scales and types, their mix, aggregation, flexibility, combination, and hybridity. This financial support must be coupled with a critical understanding of the construction industry in Lebanon, its material economy, and its environmental impact while actively engaging with issues of labor rights, whether foreign labor or local labor. The second provocation, uh, probably titled site construction, rewriting the building code, calls for exactly that, the rewriting, the rewriting of Lebanon's antiquated building code. This code has produced buildings that stand with no regard for the city's topography, landscape, or historic fabric. Reconceiving the notion of quote-unquote site beyond property lines, setback, building envelopes and footprints opens the, pot the potential to create new laws that are more in sync with Beirut's historical, environmental and physical characteristics. The third call to action uh, titled Formal and Formal Expanding Housing Architecture History are used for the importance of historical research. A nuanced architectural history constructed around the investigation of regional housing typologies and forms of settlement could move design proposals beyond the persistent unproductive opposition between modernity and tradition, allowing us, for instance, to ask what latent potentials exist in Beirut's omnipresent generic concrete slab buildings. Here, the informal physical transformation of this generic slab building type, clearly visible across the city, is evidence of both their spatial adaptability and their inhabitants' resilience in the face of decades of economic hardship and conflict. Thank you. I think I try to stay within the two minutes. Let me give it to Thanks, you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We're gonna move to. Uh, I wrote in the. We're gonna move to question five first because some of the panelists need to leave, and then we'll go back to question four. So, these panelists for question five, turn your videos on, and uh, the collective. Take it. Yeah, Abu Ghaida, GSAP alumni. This is not the first time Lebanon and Beirut embark on projects of reconstruction. The most recent of which are the reconstructions of Hart Ahrek, Project Wad after 2006, the reconstruction of downtown Beirut after the civil war with the notorious Solidaire project, having these controversial models of reconstruction in our back mirror. How can we think differently about the agency of architecture, urban planning and design, both pedagogically and in practice, in registering trauma, assisting collective healing, and the development of shared coexistence rooted in an adapted environment. Hashem Serkis, Mona Fawaz, Adrian Lahoud, and Mark Vasuta are going to take the lead on this one. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Gisab, thank you very much for transferring your spirit, uh, the spirit of convening and openly discussing hot topics in our field uh, to Beirut and to virtual space. And you always do this with radiant passion and with optimism. It is really this issue of convening 
really of bringing together the efforts of reconstruction to become more than the sum of their parts that I would like to focus on. Your efforts are efforts at MIT in collaboration with AUB and Daryl Handasa. The efforts of all those involved here today are a few of many, many efforts on the ground. We all believe in grassroots movements and we all believe in the power of individual initiatives and of the people. But we often forget that one of the recurring and underlying reasons for the failure of grassroots movements all over the world is the inability to add up, the inability to coordinate. I just want to start by making a statement uh, that there is no such thing as an organic evolution of organic movements into a collective effort if this effort is not willfully coordinated. So what you are doing is a step a much needed step in that direction. To this, I would like to add a few observations and they are three main ones. Firstly, I hope that this event is the beginning of a coordinated effort to coordinate, to collaborate, and yes, to come up with collective visions. In that sense, I want to insist that they should not exclude the state institutions and the state's infrastructure. I do hope that we do not mistake the failure and corruption of the state with the need for a state, with the importance of the idea of a state. We should keep that alive in our efforts. Secondly, I would also like to highlight our capability, what we do as architects and planners in the process of convening and creating a collective vision. Now, against this capability come two major challenges. And these are two tendencies that are ingrained both in Lebanon, the way we do planning, and in the fields we represent. That would seem antithetical to the direction that the grassroots approach is suggesting today. Firstly, we tend to put the physical first, and we also tend to work from the big picture down. Architecture and urban planning have received extensive criticism most of it valid, for their primary, primarily physical approach to planning and for their top-down approach. However, I would like to argue that there is no instrument more powerful than that of the physical, of the spatial image in capturing the imagination and inspiring social and political ideas and in mobilizing them. A very simple example, we really do not know fully what a community is until we imagine it in spatial terms. Secondly, there is nothing more powerful than the ability of the architectural image in articulating a collective imaginary, no matter how singular it is as an image. We just need to spend time thinking about how to reconcile the collective imaginary with individual imaginaries. So please let us not abandon our strengths as we attempt to correct their negative consequences. My last point is related to this issue, but bringing it back to Beirut. In the vein of putting the physical first, I would like to highlight two aspects of the post-explosion and the opportunities that it opens. Firstly, what is most unique about Lebanon is really its geography and its size. We talk about Beirut and Lebanon interchangeably, and we are one of the few countries, let's face it, in the world that has been able to, over its modern history to put together national physical plans, one after the other. We talk about national physical planning, we propose it, and we, in some cases, implement parts of it. That's partly the problem. In that sense, any, any chance, any opportunity to rethink Beirut, such as the one we're talking about, is an opportunity to think or rethink the whole country and its geography no matter how defiant it has thankfully been to human intervention. Second aspect of this point is that the explosion of the harbor presents a real opportunity for us for recentering Beirut. And I mean recentering here in a very literal spatial way. Even though the reconstruction of the downtown in the nineties was supposed to focus on the business center and the port together, it quickly pushed out of the port and focused on the city center alone. And on speculative commercial development. The explosion has brought the harbor back into the picture, 
and is inevitably shifting the center of the city's efforts and its imagination to include the city's most viable economic region, infrastructure, transportation, public health, and preservation, and inhabited neighborhoods and their intersections. This bodes well for any future and further thinking about the city's planning and that of Lebanon, not only because it expands from a center of, sorry, not only because it enters much more deeply into the economic future of the country, but also because it expands from a center focused on static space and within the national boundaries, such as the downtown, to a new center linked to a broader regional and global network that transcend the confines of the national physical boundaries. In short, I come back to the importance and dare I say to the primacy of the physical dimension of what we do and to appeal to you at Columbia from MIT, the bastion of the technical and the social aspects of what we do, to please hold on to the physical and aesthetic dimensions and to keep up the efforts of coordinating across dimensions and across geographies. Thank you. Beautiful, thank you, Dean Serkis. On to Munafawad. Thank you, Heba, and uh, thank you everyone for organizing and for having me here. And thank you, Hashem, for this plea that I will really echo in, uh, in many ways. Indeed, like you, I think that it's uh, very easy to pass a severe negative judgment on the role of planning in previous recoveries in Lebanon specifically, since this is how the question was framed. It can range from ineffective to destructive, depending on the angle you take. And while some, uh, I mean, I think for the reconstruction of Beirut downtown, the, the whole edifice has come to its logical conclusion in October 2019 and crumbled partially during the port explosion. So there's not much need for a conversation. Potentially, some may think that the reconstruction of the southern suburbs of Beirut under Hezbollah's vibe was a pro-people recovery, as some of our American colleagues have uh, attempted to claim. However, with uh, Marwan and other colleagues, I think we've really shown that uh, the way this reconstruction has happened has really trapped people in their role as supporters of the party. And in the process, really sort of uh, made them potential targets when the party is aimed at, as far as this is positive. So this is far from positive. Still, even, even as I say this, uh, I, uh, I think that I'm reluctant as a planner, as a teacher, as a thinker to drop planning, precisely because it's one of the remaining only spaces in Beirut that we think of the collective, that we think of the we that brings us together as people who share specific urban spaces, as refugees, as migrants, as landlords, as tenants, as uh, shoppers, as, uh, and despite the fact that these publics may have ruptures, that they're sectarian, that they're divided, that they're uh, patriarchal and class, still there is an effort that is being done that we feel particularly in moments of recovery where we attempt to reconstruct, reimagine those spaces in, in which we live together and in doing so re-identify ourselves as a collective. And this is something which is incredibly important. Besides that, what happens if we leave things as they are, as in the pro provocation that Marwan Randur started with? Well, I mean, if we look at how things were before we started in the districts that were affected by the blast, we find that displacement was already happening galore because of uh, central bank incentives and the central national financial policy that was encouraging banks and real estate investors to use homes and in general, the city as a place to store their capital. We find that heritage was being destroyed because uh, it was much more valuable to destroy a building and replace it with a tower for those who owned it, particularly in the context of a dysfunctional rent law and no protections for the right to live or work. In this context, simply saying we can leave people to their own uh, self and they can reconstruct their houses, I think is really dangerous because it basically is not leaving them in a space where they can imagine the regulations and transform them. We're actually leaving them vulnerable in a context where it is impossible to recover one's home as we're seeing today, in fact, with, uh, with the ongoing re recovery. That's why I, I firmly believe that planning is important and it's important as a tool, very much in line with what uh, Dean Serkis has said, to allow people to imagine the possibility of this collective, to come together and envision and dream for its role as a performative practice that can really allow us to think together uh, about what it means to have a neighborhood that connects 
uh, Madam Khail and Jim Maize to Carantina without the rupture. That reimagines Carantina not as the dump of Beirut, but actually as its lived space, as a place where people have the right as refugees, as migrants, as workers of the poor to stay in the city and have their public spaces and their living neighborhood. As a place to connect the city to its port and to recover Beirut downtown, not as a real estate asset, but actually as a place where we can live and meet just like we did in October, 2019 that can have public spaces and a real infrastructure that allows us to recover the city. So I really think from this perspective, planning is very powerful. It doesn't come with the tools of master planning and other potentially, uh, uh, put in other tools that imagine sort of a main state that's a custodian of the public good in this difficult moment, because this doesn't exist, but this doesn't exempt us from putting together this collective vision. And I'll stop here. Thank you, Muna. Uh, inspiring as always. On to Dean Lahoud. Um, thank you. I don't know how to follow both of those presentations at all. Um, it's an honor to be here. Thank you very much, Hiba, for the um, invitation. I have a short and hopefully very simple intervention to make this incredible discussion. Um, the first thing to say is that I've not been in Lebanon during the revolution, so I didn't participate in direct actions, in roadblocks, in protests, teachings. And I think it's important to state that because I think those processes are vital and their aliveness and their openness and their contagious sense of joy and, and rage and humor, which we experienced is, is, is so precious and important. Um, and I think being at a distance necessitates that anything I say should defer to that unfinished project. Um, so perhaps a reformulation of the question that I ask myself all the time is what role can the diaspora play in supporting that process? And I, and I hope that this gathering is part of, is part of answering that question. Um, I agree with Andres. I don't think there's a transformative political project that is uh, possible without the necessary, uh, a transformative architectural project that's possible without a necessary political, financial, and institutional support. I think the easier question is for architects is what to build and how to build. I think the more difficult question is um, how to transform the political economy of architecture in alignment with progressive institutional forms, how to participate in the construction of new institutions, institutions that can better secure the lives of Lebanese people. Um, I agree with the other participants. I think the trauma of the blast is in continuity with the historical debilitation of the Lebanese people and Lebanese, Lebanon's ecosystems by its political class. So I wanna ask maybe in the immediate term, what new vulnerabilities does the blast produce within that history of debilitation? What new forms of expropriation and dispossession might flow from, from that event? Um, how can we begin to guard against those processes, which no doubt have already begun? Um, revolution is a process. I agree with Hashim. I think uh, uh, coordination is important and now's the time to do it. Um, but I also think ambiguities in the early stages of revolution are, on, are not only natural, but also politically productive. Um, and so, so maybe we could try to distinguish between strategic and tactical aims if between let's say emergencies and political horizons. And if the strategic aim of the revolution was to debilitate the entire political class and replace it with the democratic alternative. Then the tactical aims are all the steps that are required for to go from where we are now um, to a socially, ecologically viable future. So maybe rather than ask what kinds of solutions architects might be able to provide, we could ask what kinds of problems can be kept alive, can be exacerbated and used for political ends. Um, there was a question in the chat in the second session that read, how can we cultivate this uh, soft infrastructure so that it speaks to the multiplicity of communities in Beirut without perpetuating exclusionary barriers such as classism, patriotism, and capitalism? A partial answer to that, I think, is to identify practical problems that are transversal to those exclusionary communities and to use them to build new communities of interest. And so to conclude, maybe just a, a question to my, to my fellow participants, about the concentration of work and the concentration of our effort, what are the one or two key political campaigns that architects can contribute to that have the potential to trouble the political class and to mobilize popular support outside of existing networks of patronage? Great, Adrian, thank you. Uh, we move to Mark. Um. I also want to thank Hiba and the collective and uh, all of my colleagues on the panel for this really great and important conversation. Um, I'm going to add a few brief comments maybe that circle around 
trauma and what I would call is the fundamental incomprehensibility of the blast itself. And, and I suppose I have to make a distinction, which is that I don't, unlike almost everyone on this panel, I don't work on Beirut. I'm not Lebanese, I'm not from Beirut, but I have spent a lot of time working in Beirut. And so I'm going to speak a little bit about that. And, and my familiarity with Beirut is in part through a collaboration with the Arab Image Foundation uh, a few years ago on a book and exhibition looking at the Iraqi architect Rifat Chatterjee and his photo archives. And at the time, Chatterjee explained to me that his obsessive photography of his buildings in Baghdad was an attempt to preserve them against the damage to come. A damage he imagined would be caused by the instabilities of the burgeoning oil economy and the unstable politics of Iraq in the 70s and 80s. And because many of his buildings were eventually destroyed by the Iraq wars, we referred to Chatterjee's photos as the product of his grim clairvoyance. The very first time we visited the Arab Image Foundation in Beirut, uh, some years earlier, Zena Erida, the director at the time, claimed that they were saving funds to build blast walls to protect the archive, blast walls that I suppose never came. So Zena's claim was the second instance of a grim clairvoyance. The all too obvious symmetry between the AIF situation and the content of the Chatterjee archives helped us realize that although we were all equipped to think about the power and authority of archives, we were less able to think about their vulnerability. And maybe this registers a little bit with the question around vulnerability that Adrian just raised. One of my points in referring to these encounters is to not only reveal another improbable symmetry between the Chatterjee AIF project and the damage caused by the recent Beirut explosion, but to also ask about the terms of the instability that both Chatterjee and Zena Erida describe. In the recent blast, the instability is obviously the catastrophic explosiveness of ammonium nitrate when heated by oil welding and fireworks, but it's also the instability of a political system that allowed the port to operate as a system of graft, referred to according to the New York Times um, as Alibaba's cave. But the instability is also legible in the relation of the blast to other politically motivated targeted blasts, the long series of car bombs that Zena Erida was referencing. Which is to say how to think the boundary between accident and attack uh, is something that comes up in this case. How to think the relationship between accident and predictability the accidentology that Virilio and others were writing about almost 20 years ago. And so how to see the blast and the damage is not only an effect of this instability, but also is something anticipated, an attack through accident, through neglectful instability, an attack on the city, its people and its buildings. And, and you know, in, in part in response to the prompt, we can say that we can also obviously see the relation to these uh, of these attacks and the history of development in Beirut. And I'm thinking of Sarah McDazzy's description of the blasting mania that characterized the reconstruction of downtown, not only for Solidaire, but for other earlier post-war reconstruction episodes in which more damage was done to buildings through the blasting of damaged buildings than during the war itself. And in and, and, and those descriptions, blasting appears like a consuming economy that in Beirut has wrapped together neoliberalism, politics, and the, the registration and the deregistration of history. Or to put it even more bluntly, the blast is politics by other means, a technique of urbanization and deurbanization, the source as well as a symptom of trauma. Wonderful, Mark, thank you. Um, thank you for the amazing panel. Thank you for the food for thought. We're gonna move now to uh, last question on heritage. Um, I know some of the panelists need to leave, so I wanna thank, uh, people who need to leave at this moment. Uh, thank you for making this um, event possible. Thank you for joining and then we'll continue. Please stay for our last question and for the open discussion. Um, on to the last question. Uh, thank you, Dean Lahou. Thank you, Dean Sarki. Thank you, Mark and Muna. Good evening. I'm Mula Salamun, Jisa Pelamna. Among the 8,000 affected buildings, 640 are historic buildings, 
approximately 60 of which are at risk of collapse as per the survey of the Lebanese Director General of Archaeology. What are the practices and technologies that can assist in the rehabilitation efforts to preserve the city's heritage? What are the different axes that we need to think about when we think about heritage reconstruction and its role in developing a shared history as well as vehicle for economic recovery? The lead to this question will be uh, given to Wael Sano, Zainab Bahrani, Abir Satsu. And we regret to inform you that due to timing, Jorge Otero Pailos has had to drop out of the event. We thank him for his attention and we will link to the current uh, to his current work um, with the GSAP Historic Preservation uh, Department in the chat. So please, Wael, uh, go ahead. Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Hiba and the team for organizing this very exciting uh, discussion and for all your efforts. Uh, so regarding my answer, I'll be talking about mainly four aspects. Uh, the first one is the conservation uh, management plan, mainly the, the data. So having access to, to data, especially during such times, is very crucial in order to ensure like a very efficient and fast response uh, to any type of emergency. And when it comes to heritage buildings, it is even more crucial because any type of intervention uh, will have a very uh, important uh, effect on uh, or impact on the authenticity of these buildings. Uh, normally, in normal cases, each heritage building should have a restitution plan that includes uh, records, archives, uh, documentation, uh, photos, drawings, a proper documentation that shows the first photo, let's say, and the last one of these buildings. And whenever we want to do like renovation works, we always take the documentation of the restitution plan uh, to ensure that our response and our intervention is very specific to specific uh, context and characteristics of these buildings. Uh, however, unfortunately, uh, in Lebanon, we don't have uh, uh, this type of documentation, which was very highly needed, especially that most of our heritage buildings were either affected with minor or major uh, damages, or even some of them were partially or fully collapsed. Uh, and as stated by uh, UNESCO, uh, almost 8,000 heritage buildings were affected and 60 are at risk of collapse. And so due to the absence of documentation, it is very crucial and important to draft a very efficient and systematic methodology on how to uh, rehabilitate these buildings in order to ensure to, to, to preserve their characteristics and their authenticity. Uh, this can be done, for example, uh, by uh, adopting solutions that fall under uh, innovative techniques and practices, like, for example, the HBIM, the Heritage in Building Information Management, where we go uh, uh, assess and survey the building, produce an, a 3D as-built uh, model of the space, and incorporate all the, the potential interventions based on specific criteria and guidelines, uh, and mainly to ensure a building back better approach through sustainable and green techniques. For example, here we can include the energy component as well, because we have this opportunity now. Uh, another aspect is the resilience plan. So we live in a seismic prone area. We are classified as a medium zone with high risk of seismic uh, activities where lots of actual earthquakes take, take place even if we don't feel them. And these types of earthquakes has a high effect on the built environment and specifically the heritage buildings, which were not designed to actually uh, withstand such natural uh, vibrations. And also it was shown after the blast that our infrastructure is very weak, be it the buildings, or the underground networks. Uh, so even most of the buildings that were affected by the blast were heritage buildings. As I said earlier, they, they cannot take lateral forces. They work on gravity. So this is why now we have to take the opportunity during the ongoing rehabilitation works uh, on including uh, elements such as the bracing elements, the structural frames or shear walls to make them uh, resilient. We have to take this opportunity now to have a resilient resilience plan for each uh, heritage buildings. Uh, so moving to the third aspect, which is the human approach, uh, most of the heritage buildings uh, are not public and we have lots of HLP, housing, land and property uh, problems. Uh, so other than the physical component of the heritage buildings, we need to promote uh, reforms to endorse the owners and the residents' rights. 
uh, this could be reflected in a national plan uh, for heritage conservation where well-protected laws are developed and endorsed. I think also this is a very important point to touch on the social aspect and to ensure the social cohesion between the local community, between the owners and the residents, because we know that this topic specifically, the heritage buildings, we have lots of problems when it comes to the housing and the land and the property. And the fourth aspect is uh, a very important one as well, which is to actually create a comprehensive heritage map for the city of Beirut in order to promote it as a heritage gem. Uh, however, here it is, not, it is not only about the heritage buildings. It is also, uh, we have around 8,000 uh, creative and cultural industries in Lebanon, out of which 4,000 were actually affected. For example, the exhibition spaces, the museums, the art centers, which are not well promoted, and I'm sure that none, we don't know all of them. So this is why it's also very important now to, 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 to have a law, law that protect them and to focus not only on the heritage built environment, but also on the, the skills and the culture that were derived from our ancestors. Uh, this will have a great influence on the economy and will create a sort of economic wheel. Uh, for example, we, when we have tourists in Lebanon, uh, like it, it shouldn't be a rule like they have to go outside Beirut to check our heritage and see what we have in Lebanon. We could, they can actually dig deeper in Beirut and see all these hidden gems, uh, the real skills and cultures that the culture that we have in, in Beirut. So mainly as, uh, as an objective, we should have heritage as a catalyst of, for economic growth and uh, social inclusion. Uh, this is my intervention. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ael, Professor Bahrain. Uh, thank you so much, Hiba, and to the collective for inviting me uh, to join all of you today. I have to say at the outset that I also am I'm not somebody who's been working in Beirut at all. Um, so I'm kind of an outsider uh, to, to this work. And uh, um, I'm happy to be a part of it because one of the things that I, I would like to advocate for is forming allegiances. And um, I think that the reason that Hiba asked me um, to join you today is because um, I work in Iraq and most of my work, or I would say pretty much all my career has been working in a uh, post-disaster situation, or I shouldn't say post-disaster because it's a continuing disaster. As you know, it's not a disaster that's ended. Um, so we continue uh, with the challenge of working within uh, such a disaster zone. So um, how do you deal uh, with these issues? When, Of course, when I first heard about the Beirut blast, um, I was heartbroken as everyone else for all of my uh, friends and uh, even family that I have there. Uh, but one of my immediate thoughts uh, right afterwards was about exploitation, the potential exploitation. And the reason that this came to my mind is not simply because I'm a pessimist, but because of what I've seen happen um, in the place where I work, Iraq. Um, so heritage preservation, uh, we have heard that there are all of these buildings that have been damaged and heritage preservation is of course a very important thing. Um, but I think uh, what I would like to warn or caution is that it, it works, uh, although we often tend to think of it as somehow unrelated to politics because it's heritage, that it actually works within frames of power. And so I would caution that we have to be careful about um, what we call authorized heritage discourse. And I think that we need some really radical changes um, in the way that we talk about these things and the way that things are done. So I would uh, be cautious of authorized heritage discourse and with the regimes of funding um, that are associated with it. Um, because this is something that you're going to have to deal with in Beirut very soon. Uh, and the regimes of funding have to do with uh, how the work is conducted, uh, when the funding begins and ends, what you're allowed to do, also how 
uh, heritage buildings and neighborhoods are defi defined. And so, of course, what happens is with international stakeholders and uh, privatization and, and NGOization coming in, what happens is that a redefinition of neighborhoods along sectarian lines. Um, and this is something that I've seen happening in Iraq. Uh, I would like to say that it's just something that's happened internally um, and blame it on the Iraqi government. But unfortunately, it's also to be put, the, the onus also has to be put on international organizations that are supporting a sectarian view um, and imposing it through regimes of funding um, that we have to depend upon to do our work uh, there. So it's led to actually uh, greater disaster and, and greater violence and greater toxicity, I would say. Um, so uh, I appreciate what Marwan said at the beginning um, about uh, deregulization and, and getting rid of uh, such things. Um, because I do think that what we need across the region, I think what we need are some truly radical uh, changes in our vision, in, our, in, in the way that we uh, dream about what we uh, want for our future. We have to be, we have to hope for really radical differences and changes. And I think the only way that we can do, do those is to, um, go ahead and take the lead ourselves. But I also at the same time worry about deregulation um, because what's happened in, in the world where I work on the ground, I mean, not theoretically, but really right there in the field and um, working on these issues in uh, so many ways that um, this has been used, it's a two-edged sword because it's also, again, been used for exploitation. Um, and then uh, uh, private interests have come in and allowed uh, uh, neighborhoods to be destroyed in the interest of uh, building something that would be uh, more profitable for outside forces and so on and so forth. And of course, a part of this has become uh, a way to uh, um, kind of uh, perpetuate forms of ethnic cleansing by forced movements of people from neighborhoods um, in the interest of preserving or reconstructing a heritage neighborhood. But in fact, what it ends up being is forcibly relocating people um, because a particular ethnicity or sect happened to live there. So I just want to uh, warn um, about these uh, terrible things that have happened that I've experienced over the past 18 years of my work in Iraq. Um, I've tried to uh, do what I, what I consider a kind of a counter mapping and documentation of historical architecture and uh, monuments throughout the country. And I think of this as a kind of a counter mapping. And I have to, I mean, since somebody mentioned Rafat Chadzarchi, I would like to, um, have a shout out to, to him in his memory because uh, it was his work is among the, the, the my predecessors, my Iraqi predecessors who did try to document all kinds of things uh, before it was too late. And I see my work as um, being along those line, lines. Um, and uh, I hope that we can continue to have these conversations with people in Beirut. Um, and another thing that I thought of uh, with the explosion or what I read at the time um, was this beautiful poem by Muhammad Mahdi al-Jawahiri um, about uh, Beirut and Baghdad, Beirut and ba uh, Baghdad um, being uh, sort of uh, sisters in, in in confronting and facing disaster and, and pain and how the pain of Beirut is really the pain of Baghdad and uh, that we uh, carry our pain in our hearts. And I hope that we can form these allegiances and work together uh, towards a more hopeful future and not be too pessimistic um, 
about all of the disasters that we've confronted. Thank you, Zainab, so much for the food of thought. For the, for the food of thought, and we're gonna call on Abir as a, as a resident of of Marim Khair, of a, of a heritage architecture to maybe provide that kind of perspective. Thank you. Uh, a former resident. <laughs> um, I I will just uh, briefly echo on the reconstruction law that Karim already mentioned uh, because it's also important to say that. This reconstruction law, uh, because there's always a very big concern in the public discourse about heritage, the law uh, also focuses on heritage in response to a, uh, like a, a big call uh, where uh, the state tried to show that it has been responding to the ongoing debate, which is really a lot about uh, a mere focus on buildings. And this is what the law does. It focuses on buildings without any motivation to link it to the social fabric, to communities and to livelihoods. And this is very reminiscent of the heritage preservation efforts in post-Civil War Beirut, uh, which were detached from housing rights and hence led to uh, mass waves of uh, demolitions and displacements. Um, and so along the same approach, a lot of the heritage assessments being done on the ground by private and public actors do not include in these assessments any form of occupancy in the surveys or do not include uh, socioeconomic conditions of inhabitants. Um, so, for instance, a lot of the a lot of the inhabitants of these 640 historic buildings are old tenants um, because these buildings are in a very bad condition. Um, there is a need for a very quick renovation to ensure a quick return of residents. However, um, so far procedures that have been put to renovate uh, historic buildings have been tied to a very complicated bureaucratic process, uh, very stringent uh, renovation criteria. And of course, uh, the need for renovation permits that are only linked to the acceptance of the landlord. So we've seen a lot of cases where uh, not only old tenants, but tenants in general who are willing to return and willing to them pay the renovation, but this has been blocked by the control of the landlord who doesn't want to renovate because to some uh, landowners and in Marim Khail and the surrounding areas, a lot of these cases are real estate developers. Some of them uh, uh, are using this as a chance to actually evict uh, tenants, uh, whether they're uh, rent control tenants or uh, tenants under the current rent law. And so as such, we like uh, if residents are not taken into consideration, really the 640 historic buildings that will be renovated will actually turn into a process of gentrification. It will halt the return of residents and it will uh, make their uh, rental a value in the market much higher. So as such, th there's really a need today to possibly shift the debate from heritage buildings towards actually the historic socioeconomic life of these neighbor neighborhoods. So in fact, if we, if we think of the area of Marim Khail, there, there is a local economy that existed since the 1920s. We can understand this local economy as a historic one. Uh, it consisted of crafts, of old businesses, and so on. And this low, old economy had been deteriorating for the past 10 years before the, the explosion, while heritage buildings were actually still standing. Um, and so uh, um, making, uh, creating a further rupture between uh, the built uh, historic buildings and what actually happened in these historic buildings won't actually lead us anywhere. I think it will reproduce the conditions that were happening uh, since before the blast in terms of waves of displacement and the rupture of uh, socioeconomic relations. And just to end up, uh, I think it, we really need to go back here to prioritizing users to think of their role in defending these houses. And here, just like to link back to the discussion that was happening, there is a real fear that us uh, as professionals or practitioners or planners or so on, if 
uh, we do not think of users and residents of the neighborhoods as a part as like an, an important part of what's happening we will also play a role in further marginalizing them because they do not have existing organizational frameworks they do not own institutions we own institutions we're part of ngos of universities uh, and so on but they don't neighborhood committees don't exist uh, organizational frameworks for residents don't exist they have been actually been uh, uh, explicitly killed uh, throughout the years of the civil war and after and as such we really need to be aware of that and understand our positionality in that and put uh, it takes a lot of effort but actually play a leading role uh, with them uh, and i will end here thank you <laughs> thank you Avi. thank you everyone uh, and what a, a, a great note to end on so um uh, we are way past our time, but it's fine. We're going to stay. Please, whoever can stay, turn your video on. Uh, there are many questions already in the, uh, in the Q&A. I know we're about 160 people are still with us. So if you guys have questions in the audience, please post them for us. And uh, I'm going to leave it for the collective to moderate uh, this session and uh, the panelists who are uh, still online. Hi, uh, my name is Dina Mahmoud. I'm a GSAP alumna. Um, so me and Maya are going to be moderating the Q&A. Um, again, feel free to type any more questions in the chat. Um, we'll be directing questions uh, to people and certain questions and other questions will be left open. So um, Maya is going to start with the first question. Hi, everyone. Um, so we tried to combine a few uh, questions from the chat. Uh, the first one is about the port. And how can the port maintain its economic functionality and avoid being overtaken by developers and gentrification? What do you think about opening it up to the public and integrating and connecting it to the city after its rehabilitation? And what are your thoughts on converting the silos or the site into a memorial monument? I'd like to open it for any of the panelists who'd like to answer. Anyone? Yet, Mona? I can do it. I mean, I can try to start a conversation and maybe throw a few uh, ignorant provocations that would get others to uh, intervene. Um, I, I'll just say that the Port of Beirut has really changed a lot its uh, position and its interaction with the city. Uh, as you guys know, uh, the port, uh, the neighborhoods that were affected by the blast were all developed in connection to the port. Whether it's Quarantina, which was the city's quarantine, or whether it's Beirut downtown, that, and, and the expansion of the port that made Beirut the city it is, the port was an integral element. And these neighborhoods house all the services that uh, had to do with the port. Except in the post-Civil uh, War era, the port increasingly became this piece of uh, infrastructure that's dissociated from the city. It became more and more a transporting area, and it turned its back to the city. And the pier that exploded was an old storage place where they used to leave the things that no one asked for, including, believe it or not, apparently, what was it, 2,800 tons of ammonium nitrate? So, uh, <laughs> and fireworks next to them. So, it's, so, so, so in the last decade, there has already been calls among colleagues and urbanists to uh, to try and recover that piece of the port as an as a connection to the city, as an open area, and to create a continuity of the city's coast and bring it all the way here. And many of my colleagues are thinking about this as they're teaching studios right now and thinking about the city, how we connect that piece of the port at least back to the city and recover it. I personally think that while this can be a long-term ambitious, uh, really nice project, um, it is potentially more important immediately to think about what can be recovered immediately as, uh, as a place that's still livable, that people are still using before we lose it also to vulture capitalism. That's why I, I feel that 
particularly in the absence of a state or a custodian of the common good that would actually champion a pro-people uh, recovery, we need to start with the neighborhoods. And if we're going to start with the neighborhoods and with people who live there, because they're the only people who can make these things accountable, while the port and the commemoration are all wonderful initiatives, and I can only imagine what beautiful urban design and urban planning interventions can be, it may be more critical right now to begin to think what do we set in place in the neighborhoods to recover them, not only as individual home, but also as collectives and as places that are lived in and that function as economic engines for a different economy of the city. Because right now what we're seeing is everything is closing up. The stores are closing, people are leaving, the tenants are leaving. So don't be so worried, honestly, and I'll stop here, I swear, Heba. Don't be so worried about gentrification because there is no gentrification. There's just very rapid impoverishment. And anyone who can come and open a small store and send stuff and, and sell some stuff and uh, allow people in the neighborhood to benefit a little bit would be great. Yeah, no, here, here there's no time limit. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Mona. Thank you. Would anyone uh, like to add anything? Maybe Marwan or Mark? Um, I, I, I probably want to ask the people in Beirut, aren't there also um, uh, investors coming in and uh, seeing the opportunity of uh, the disaster as a way to, so it uh, shouldn't also there be some thinking about the protection against all of these. I mean, we know that it happened in every uh, previous battle and this is one of the few that I was not in Beirut. Uh, so the, is it, uh, I'm wondering, uh, should we worry about gentrification from that perspective and the fact that there is a, probably a lot of investors that are now interested in these uh, neighborhoods that are more preserved than other places in the city? And when you Thanks. actually uh, answered one of the questions for us that was going to be directed to you. Um, uh, the, there is a question directed to Karim Namur. I think he's still on, hopefully. Um, there you are. Hi. Uh, so how has the refugee influx of the last few years affected gentrification, rent prices, and displacement in Beirut? And how do we include minorities and refugees in, this, in the frameworks of reconstruction? That's a very good question because actually uh, uh, in the area, in the Manchayel area, you had a lot of uh, non-Lebanese residents, basically, more, uh, a lot of domestic workers who lived there, a lot of refugees themselves who lived there. Um, uh, I'm not really sure I, could, I can answer as a lawyer how it affected gentrification, but I can tell you that the, the uh, uh, narrative basically from the point of view of refugees and domestic workers and foreign workers in general was completely absent from the post uh, 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 Beirut blast. Uh, it was thanks to initiatives and uh, organizations like the anti-racism movement who basically really put forth uh, this narrative, um, noting that a lot of those refugees and a lot of those foreign workers, a big chunk of them, um, uh, are undocumented workers, basically. So they are in the most vulnerable uh, um, situation amongst the residents who live there. And they basically have almost no uh, uh, protective mechanism uh, uh, legally. Uh, this, of course, would affect uh, access to housing because uh, uh, they, will, they wouldn't be able to uh, register uh, uh, rents, uh, uh, officially, uh, so they would have to resort to uh, um, very informal uh, uh, housing. A lot of them were in informal housing before, so they had no guarantees in terms of damages. Uh, some of them were injured, uh, some of them lost their houses, and uh, they have no alternatives. So again, uh, this is where, unfortunately, I mean, fortunately, unfortunately, NGOs are stepping in. I, I say unfortunately because I want the state to intervene really here in this, in this sphere. I don't want this trend of having privatizations through NGO happen because it really benefits the 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 the, 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 on the neoliberal uh, uh, philosophy that basically really governed the Lebanese state for the last couple of decades. Um, I'm going to take also this opportunity just to correct myself on something because I was I don't want Mona to hit me. <laughs> she already did a little bit on WhatsApp. I, I didn't mean that there was a good side to disaster capitalism. I just meant that disaster is also an opportunity in, uh, to, to rethink space 
uh, and basically fight um, all uh, radical ideas that come from neoliberal policies and that profit from that. Sir. So I'm trying to really turn the table on neoliberalism here by saying that when the disaster happens, like the pandemic, like the Beirut blast, it is also an opportunity for other radical ideas that uh, uh, to emerge. For instance, in terms of rethinking uh, 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 public space, in terms of rethinking housing, uh, what sort of housing do we want, and workspace. So just I want this on record so that I, I would hear I would hear the end of it from Mona actually. <laughs> Thank you, Karim. Uh, I'd like to move to a question that uh, Nesreen marked as uh, that she, she would answer it. Um, so it's actually um, one of the first few uh, questions. What do, you th what do you think is the most realistic approach to move forward given what happened in the past 100 days? Will it be a city indulged in even more ruins? Or do you think it's realistic to expect some sort of rebuild in the areas most affected, considering uh, the surge of uh, COVID. Nasreen? I'll confess that I clicked that by mistake, but I can still attempt. Um, so, uh, I mean, if you walk around the neighborhoods, th there actually is activity. There's some rebuilding, there's a lot of fixing happening. A lot of it is uh, initiatives like the ones that Rana was describing and was actually involved in, that Muna has been describing and documenting. So. It, it, no, I, I think that that uh, comment painted an extremely bleak scenario. We're not there. Um, I, I'd like to link that though to the question that Marwan just asked, which is about investors coming in and vultures coming in, and um, it's sort of part of the disaster capitalism. Yes, the explosion is going to aggravate the same in incentives that really were already there because of the economic crisis. So here it's concentrated geographically and yes, potentially it is a neighborhood that has a specific aesthetic appeal or some sort of culture to it that maybe can be financialized. But this kind of dispossession is happening, has been happening ever since the economic collapse. It's less centralized, it's less geographically concentrated and um, it's probably across a lot of sectors, not just real estate. But that's that's exactly. I mean, this is the impoverishment that we were trying to grapple with here, and we're trying to identify and diagnose and map as accurately as we can and as comprehensively as we can. And this is a, probably a very uh, brute force uh, sh uh, show of it, a, a brute, sort of a brute manifestation of it. But it's it's just an accelerated, magnified form. But it is happening anyway. It's happening everywhere, not just in that neighborhood, and not just because of the port explosion, just because of the general impoverishment, and the and the and the ability, the, the huge disparities that I was describing, and the ability for some actors to just sit back and wait until things are dire enough that they can reap uh, incredible resources for very little. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, just as a, as a, there was a question in the chat, and we're going to end after here about the building for the war yet to come. Uh, and uh, I, I chose specifically not to speak, speak today because of that. But my, my answer to that is actually that the categories of peace, war, explosion, crisis are very not distinct. And I think this is where we need to start rather than idealizing what peace is and what war uh, is about. But the questions of what we try to talk about today is how to build for whom, for what kind of future or futures is a much needed conversation that we need to continue to have. And I, have today, I hope that today's event was just a start or more actually of a continuation of the amazing work that many of you here on the screen have been doing and I'm sure many of the people who are listening to us. I wanna thank everyone for keeping the hope going. Although many of us here have been through many reconstructions and we've talked about it, um, but it, as I said, the collective gave me a lot of hope, and I think this conversation was also a very hopeful note too. So let's keep uh, let's keep the war yet to come to the side and hope for a better kind of future that is not uh, that is different than what we had uh, previously. I want to thank the collective for being an amazing group of people. Uh, it was my pleasure. Thank you for the panelists for being my mentors and and people who continue to inspire me. And um, till soon again, I want to thank everyone, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll continue to do this in the future. <laughs>